to item two. This is questions and I call on the Honourable Member for Russian, Dr Hayward, to ask question one. Thank you, Mr President. I should like to ask the Chief Minister whether he is satisfied that the conditions supporting the endemic <coughs> approach to living with COVID are still being met and if he'll make a statement. I call on Archivashok, Chief Minister, to reply. Mr President, on the 1st of April 2022, the Isle of Man moved to treat coronavirus as an endemic disease similar to other illnesses such as flu and novovirus. In the document published by this government entitled Moving to an Endemic Approach, the general return to normality was based on a number of assumptions. Firstly, that our health services were operating normally. Secondly, that vaccines remained available and effective. Thirdly, that there were no new variants of concern. Fourthly, that the situation on the island was stable, and fifthly, that the British Isles situation was stable. These assumptions continue to be reviewed, and there has been no broad change in any of these areas. So for the time being, whilst there may be changes in the numbers of people infected, there does not appear to be a need to increase levels of government intervention at this time. That is not to say, however, that we are being complacent. We should be under no misapprehension that the winter will bring with it additional pressures on our health service, not just through COVID-19, but through other winter respiratory viruses such as influenza. That is why one of the first actions of our Interim Director of Public Health was to work with the Chief Executive Officer of the Department of Home Affairs to set up a working group to coordinate plans for the coming winter. The first meeting of the group was on the 7th of July 2022. The Interim Director of Public Health is developing a plan to enhance surveillance of respiratory diseases over this coming winter. Manx Care has also been working on a draft winter plan. These plans will be fully developed by the end of September. It is important, Mr President, that we are prepared not just within the health service, but more broadly to respond to challenges which may arise from increased numbers of people affected by winter viruses. It was always expected that levels of COVID-19 circulating in the community would ebb and flow significantly with periods of higher infection in response to particular circumstances. For example, we've recently seen higher levels of COVID-19 increase following the TT, uh, as well as bank holiday events, which also have uh, a likely impact on the pattern of spread. However, the overall situation in the Isle of Man and the British Isles is being carefully monitored, and I am satisfied that adequate precautions in relation to the ongoing risks posed by COVID-19 are being pursued. Supplementary, Dr Hayward. Uh, thank you. Can I ask then in that context what work is currently underway to monitor for variants of concern and their arrival in the Isle of Man? How many samples are being sent for genetic sequencing each week and during the recent wave of TT associated infections was that genetic testing number increased? I'm sure the Chief Minister will agree with me that if one of the conditions is no new variants of concern then we have to be actively looking for that uh, yeah. and carrying out surveillance. How can we be certain that no new variants of concern are here and is there a clear policy of testing in place? And does that number increase during wo the waves that we will be experiencing? Chief Minister to reply. Uh, Mr President, I will uh, respond uh, in detail by written format as to, as to exactly how the uh, uh, search for new variants is being undertaken. But my understanding is that that is being uh, monitored and uh, effectively uh, uh, re reported to the Iron Man via the UK Department of Health. Supplementary, Dr Hayward. Thank you. Uh, further to that, can I ask what work has been undertaken to recognise that high levels of COVID infection and repeated infections, which we are now seeing because the uh, natural immunity from Omicron doesn't last more than about 28 days apparently, is going to expose a greater number of people to long COVID. The estimates vary that this may be up to 5% for each round of infection. Has the economic impact of allowing high levels of infection been assessed? What's the predicted impact on productivity, economic growth and the predicted pressure on the benefits system? Thank you. Chief Minister to reply. Uh, I think uh, the, the Honourable Member will recognise that uh, measuring that type of uh, impact in, into the future is a highly variable task that probably covers and encompasses a huge range of scenarios. Uh, Mr President, I, my view is that we need to be practical about matters here. We absolutely cannot be complacent about the impact of COVID-19, but we also must recognise the significant economic damage that is brought about by government actions uh, in that respect, such as uh, asking people to stay at home uh, and even moving towards uh, such, such items as, as, as wearing masks. So we do need to take our future actions 
uh, ensuring that we have fully evaluated the situation, recognising, of course, the negative impact of any COVID change in COVID-19 um, circumstances, and the Council of Ministers will continue to do that on a considered and practical basis. Supplementary, Ms. Lord Brennan. Thank you, Mr. President. And would the Chief Minister agree with me that, in terms of how will emerging variants of concern be identified, that these will be picked up via existing systems of epidemiological surveillance, including wastewater surveillance and genomic sequencing, undertaken from time to time by Noble's Pathology Lab to identify strains in circulation? <coughs> That's um, part of the response that's been given in terms of public, public health, and I think it might be helpful to acknowledge that in, in terms of the questioner's um, question. Thank you. Chief Minister to reply. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet Min Office Minister for a helpful uh, question there, uh, Mr President, which I think speaks for itself. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. With regard to uh, Minister Lord Brennan's input, could the Chief Minister give us a little bit more information, please, on this surveillance that's currently occurring? Thank you. Minister to reply. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be happy to write to honourable members, as I've already suggested, giving a full level of uh, breakdown about the surveillance, how many tests are undertaken, when they're undertaken, and uh, what happens to the subsequent results of those tests. Move to question two, and I call on the honourable member for Russian, Lorda. Good morning, Dr. Wayne. I uh, beg leave to ask the Chief Minister why the Climate Change Plan 2022 to 2027 has not been put on the Register of Business or on the order paper for the July 2022 sitting of Tynwald in Douglas. Call on Archie Bishop, <coughs> Chief Minister, to reply. Mr. President, I thank the Honourable uh, Member, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> for his question, which of course he wouldn't have known at the time, but uh, will now find, of course, that the Climate Change Plan has been put on the Register for Business, and I'd like to assure him and the Honourable Court that I'll give an update <coughs> on that plan in my climate change statement later in the sitting. Supplementary order. Will the Chief Minister accept that by not putting the plan um, on July, in fact it should have been done by April, that the Government is actually already in breach of the Climate Change Act? Yeah, yeah. Minister to reply. I acknowledge uh, that we have uh, been delayed in this process, but uh, I would suggest that better to get it right uh, than get it wrong, and I hope that honourable members will find the documentation that is on the register uh, of business now and due for uh, debate in October to be <coughs> of significant interest to them. Supplementary, Lord. I was just wondering what uh, impact the six month delay, um, possibly more by the time we've debated it in this place in October, is going to have on implementation, for, uh, the government's implementation plan. Chief Minister to reply. I think uh, many of those actions, uh, strategies, and commitments that are outlined are already at the planning stage. Uh, I would hope it would have an absolute minimal impact, uh, Mr. President, in terms of setting out to achieve our climate change uh, action plan targets. Move on to question three, and I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castletown Malou, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I'd like to ask the Treasury Minister whether maternity and child support payments will be reviewed before the budget in 2023. Thank you. Well, Minister, Minister for Treasury to reply. Thank you, Mr President. In answering the Honourable Member's question, I've assumed that he's referring to the amounts of maternity allowance and child benefit payable under the Social Security legislation. I can confirm that the rates of all Social Security benefits and allowances will be reviewed by Treasury in the autumn, with new rates coming into effect from the start of the new tax year. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Um, is the current maternity allowance seen as adequate? It doesn't appear to have been increased since 2011. Um, why is less paid if you're self-employed? And also, there's no additional payment made for multiple births. Are those the sort of things that will be considered going forward? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, um, Mr <coughs> President. Um, if I could just respond to the Honourable Member. As regards maternity allowance, the amount payable to a woman depends on whether she is employed or self-employed. If she was employed and subject to her satisfying the work and earnings tests, she would be paid maternity allowance at the rate of 90% of her, her, of her average earnings during the relevant period, subject to a maximum of £179.85 per week. If she was self-employed and has been paying Class 2 self-employed national insurance contributions, she would be paid maternity allowance at the standard rate, which is currently worth £156.66 a week. And maternity allowance can be paid for up to 39 weeks and is not means-tested. 
Now, in terms of his further questions, we have to recognise there's a significant cost of maternity allowance, um, and also statutory maternity pay does not exist on the island at the moment. Instead, maternity allowance is payable to qualifying employees, irrespective of their rights to contracted maternity pay. But certainly, I'd like to assure him and this honourable court that during the um, during the summer, we will be looking at all the benefits we pay and actually looking at um, statutory maternity pay and how we treat working families um, and women who are working and then want to start a family, I hope will be part of the overall review of employment legislation that's also being undertaken by the Department for Enterprise. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Ms. for a very detailed all-income answer there. Um, just one slight concern is the, the information that's available on the website in terms of the clarity. There's information that's actually stating that, um, that uh, maternity support is available for a maximum of 39 weeks um, and it starts at the time of birth, but in reality it's actually going to be influenced by things like contributions <coughs> from the employer. And it's only a small thing, but some ladies have said it's caused issues in the past in terms of clarity. Will the Minister be prepared to look at that, please? Thank you very much, Mr President. Minister, to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. And, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. As I've said, the, the issue around various benefits can be um, a little bit complicated in terms of employment status. And what I would suggest is if anyone is a little bit confused by the website, they phone one of our advisors who can go through their personal circumstances and advise them accordingly. Thank you. Move on to question four. I call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for the Treasury what progress has been made since March 2021 <coughs> with extending the flood re-scheme to the island. Mr Bayshock, uh, Minister of Treasury to reply. Thank you, Mr President. In March 2021, officers of the United Kingdom Department of Environment, <coughs> Food and Rural, Rural Affairs, DEFRA, were contacted regarding possible access to the flood RE scheme by our island residents. During April 2021, the UK responded detailing the issues that would need to be resolved or worked through. An initial response was provided and the first formal meeting with the UK was held in June 2021. Two key issues that must be resolved before any further progress could be made emerged from the discussion. The first key issue is how to align the Isle of Man rateable values of properties with the United Kingdom Council tax banding for the calculation of the flood RE premiums. The second key issue was how to establish legislation to support the extension of the scheme to the Isle of Man. It was confirmed that this would require an amendment to UK primary legislation. It is clear that this may only be considered further if it is possible to resolve the first issue in terms of a formula for notionally aligning our rates with the UK council tax banding system to the satisfaction of the UK. The issue of how to align our rates for the purposes of flood RE is providing a technical challenge. Consequently, it has not been possible to further progress the matter with the UK DEFRA so far. Mr President, it is important to highlight that even if it were possible to address these two key issues and other secondary issues raised by the UK, it is conceivable that one possible outcome might be that whilst household insurance premiums might become more affordable for some in existing flood risk areas, others not living in flood risk areas could be required to pay much higher premiums. This is a risk and clearly a challenge we would need to address. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you. And I thank the Minister for his detailed response. Um, can he advise <coughs> whether this is being progressed actively? whether in fact the Isle of Man uh, reforming its rateable system and aligning Isle of Man properties with, ta with the ban bans in the UK is actively being considered by Treasury or is there an alternative way forward that might involve um, Treasury or the Isle of Man having its own flood re-scheme for the number of properties, significant numbers in my constituency but actually of impacting people all around the island, particularly in coastal areas. Um, what reassurance can he offer those people that there is light at the end of the tunnel and that they will be, there will be um, a safety net for them when they are unable to obtain house insurance? Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'd like to, to reassure the Honourable Member that um, contact is still underway and we're looking at whether we can work with the UK Government value, valuer um, in terms of properties to see if, if a midway point could be achieved. And, and 
I, I, you know, she's obviously talking for her constituents in Lexi, but similarly, there are lots of other areas in our, our island which are prone to flooding and where, by being on a flood risk map, um, does affect um, both access and cost to insurance. And certainly, Treasury have had discussions with local providers to try to make sure that the access to flood insurance is provided as and where possible. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs. Kane. Uh, the Minister aware, following significant amount of work undertaken in Laxey um, for reducing the possible impacts of flood in the village, um, residents who are able to obtain flood insurance are finding premiums at th two or three times the previous amount. So even when flood insurance, house insurance, property insurance is, is able to be obtained, it's at significant higher rates. So could we find a position where significant part of the Isle of Man coastal resorts actually are uninhabitable or cannot be purchased by ordinary people. What is <coughs> Treasury going to do to prevent that from happening and to provide um, the, the necessary uh, ability for people to obtain flood insurance? Or is Treasury pursuing flood re with the UK government or is it considering another way forward? Thank you. Minister to reply. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. As I've said, uh, Treasury is pursuing the issue of access to the flood RE scheme um, with the UK government, but as th there are some major problems in terms of that. And again, the, the flood RE scheme in the United Kingdom is only meant to last until 2039, by which time, hopefully, um, the, the remedial um, measures that they will bring in will do significantly reduce the risk of flooding. And again, the Honourable Member and her constituents have benefited from a huge amount of investment in their local area to reduce the risk of flooding. But unfortunately, because of the geography, particularly around Laxey, that risk of flooding is always there. And, and the traditional insurance companies will always, always um, count that in. She talks about houses being uninhabitable. They're not uninhabitable. What we're talking about is access to insurance, to flood insurance, and the cost of that insurance. And what I hope is that by the remedial work that's been carried out by the Isle of Man government, that risk will reduce, and so local providers may be able to offer better premiums to her constituents. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, with regard to the map, there are still certain concerns regarding Castletown. Have all the correct people been informed about the improvements that have occurred in the town in terms of flood defence improvements. Thank you very much. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. There's a huge amount of work going on in terms of the flood risk. One of the actions of the previous administration was to consolidate this action um, with one particular body under the Department for, for Infrastructure. Looking forward, we have to see flood risk as being part of overall climate change. Although we're going through a drought I'm oh, sorry, a heat wave at the moment, and there are concerns about um, water shortages. These extremes of temperature, these extremes of weather will continue, and that's why, as part of the climate change agenda, we must invest in the infrastructure of our island to protect both the livelihood and the homes of our residents. Thank you. Move on to question five, and I call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. Um, another question for the Minister for the Treasury, please. Uh, can he tell us what plans Treasury has to continue supporting Laxey Glen Mills Limited? Very shocked, Minister for Treasury, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. As members of this Honourable Court will be aware, Laxey Glen Mills has been significantly affected by the recent closure of its largest customer. The shareholding in the company is owned by the Chief Secretary and the Chief Financial Officer, and I know they've been in close contact with the directors of the company whilst its board determines the best course of action for the business moving forward. Of course, the future of the mill is closely aligned to the island's food security strategy, subject to current consideration by the Department for Environment, Food and Agriculture. Treasury has recently provided cash flow support to the business and has volunteered the use of one of its officers to help it prepare management accounts and other financial information. Mr President, the Treasury and other parts of government are supporting the business whilst an appropriate future direction is mapped out and I'm conscious that we should recognise the hard work and dedication of the staff and management of the mill who are continuing to work through these difficult times. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Can he advise what cash flow support, what level of cash flow has been provided from Treasury, whether that's a temporary measure 
Um, could he confirm that the previous year there was a £19,000 loss over the entire year? Can he give us any prediction what that, um, as, as primary shareholder, what the government anticipates that could be this year? Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. I mean, in terms of the um, loss, the operating loss last year, um, it has to be recognised that the Lexi Glen Mill is sitting on considerable assets at the moment in terms of um, wheat, um, and, and that has to be taken into account in terms of their overall financial position. In terms of the cash flow that's been provided, this is bringing forward some of the grants and, and, and um, money that Treasury were going to um, bring, bring, bring over this financial year. Um, I understand that the Honourable Member has a question number 12 for the DEFA Minister, and hopefully that will elucidate more in terms of the overall strategy for looking at the long-term viability of the mill, looking at the way we support agriculture on our island, and also how we guarantee food security. But I can uh, tell the Honourable Member for Garth that certainly Treasury are working quite closely with DEFA to ensure that we make the right decision, both for the mill itself, but also for the wider aspects of our island. Thank you. Move on to question six, and I call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. I beg to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture what progress has been made with the implementation of an additional educational needs code. I call on Shop, Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The Department of Education, Sport and Culture has produced an aspirational additional educational needs code of practice in consultation with schools, unions, parents and other relevant stakeholders to address a range of issues. Implementation of the code is dependent upon appropriate budgetary provision. If budget is secured, an implementation plan will be devised with schools and other relevant stakeholders with a view to having an interim AEN code in place from September 23. Statutory elements of the AEN code will be brought into force once the first amendment bill, education amendment bill has received royal assent. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, there was a consultation around the Additional Educational Needs Code back in October 2020, so nearly two years ago. Um, in that consultation, the Department committed to continue to draft the ENA Code of Practice, making specific reference to the themes raised in the stakeholder survey. From the Minister's answer, it appears that nothing is any further forward because there's no budget for this. Can I ask when the department intends to come forward? Um, is it going to be as part of the budget process or is it actually going to be an inter-year budget process? And it's all very well have an aspirational code, Mr. President, but can I, ask, uh, can I ask, is there a code ready to be implemented should the budget be approved? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the current draft AEN code is primarily based on a range of existing legislation. However, the code envisages an extended role for schools to create a statutory plan securing the provision that a child's needs are calls for. Current legislation reserves such plans for the department. The amending legislation that will come before this honourable place also establishes an independent tribunal for parents to challenge provision made for their child. The current legislation only provides for an internal desk appeal. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you, Mr. President. I didn't hear any timescales in the answer there, Mr. President. And what I'm specifically asking is, assuming things go to plan for the department, <coughs> when it would be expected that an AEN will be in place, um, because this has been dragging on for a long time now. Parents and carers are getting frustrated going round and round the same circle. So what I'm asking is, when is it likely to come forward and be actually implemented? And I want, I'm wondering if there is an actual timescale, Mr President, not as I received in a previous question time from DOI, a DOI near future or shortly. Is there an actual timescale? Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I did state in my, my answer that we would have an AEN code hopefully in place for September 23. I'm certainly very keen to make sure that that is the case and we'll work hard to um, deliver that. However, we are also going through a full funding review for education, which I'm sure will pick up on some of the areas. Uh, we've, we, we've done an estimate of what we think this implementing this code is going to cost and that is significant and we will need to have budgetary concurrence from Treasury to implement the code. Supplementary, Mrs. Corlett. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Can I ask the Minister, is there a clear intention to put the requirements of the Benaya Yang Code into legislation? And if so, when will that happen? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, um, there is, and particularly the independent um, tribunal element. Um, the legislation is currently being drafted and is coming forward in the next um, year's uh, legislative programme. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, can I, uh, in order to have an AEN, there has to be a definition of additional educational needs, Mr. President. So can I ask the Minister, does the Department have a definition yet of additional education needs? As at the time of the consultation back in October 2020, it was stated that the definition was yet to be determined. And if there is such a definition, can it be shared? Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, certainly the code is ready to go, um, which will have those definitions is in it. I'm happy to obviously meet with the Honourable Member and we can go, go through um, the work that has been carried out to date so far. Um, but it's envisaged that the new amendment bill will give statutory power to the AEN Code of Practice and provide for the identified gaps that were in the legislation in relation to additional educational needs. Final supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. I'll give it another go. Um, a yes or no, is there now a definition of additional educational needs and would the, member, uh, would the Minister circulate that to all Timwood members? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I certainly will commit to circulating that. We move on to question seven. I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury, Castletown and Maloo, Mr Glover. Good morning, Dr Anne. Seek leave to ask the uh, Minister for Education, Sports and Culture why off-island consultants have been appointed to conduct the review of swimming pools. Shop, Minister for Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The Department followed the Isle of Man Government procurement process to determine which organisation could evidence via their application best value, industry knowledge and experience against the terms of reference for that review. One of the three companies that submitted tenders, Knight, Kavanagh and Page, demonstrated via a scoring system that they were the most suitable organisation to undertake the external review. I am pleased to advise that the consultant has recently been on the island to commence the review and the Council of Ministers will look forward to receiving the report at the end of September. Supplementary, Mr Glover. Is she confident that uh, an off-island consultant is going to have uh, knowledge of uh, the unique community sense on the Isle of Man and what steps are being taken to make that happen. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, clearly within the scope, um, stakeholders will be um, spoken to by, by the consultants. The other companies that tendered had no background in swimming pools, recreation or leisure, whilst Knight, Kavanagh and Page provided a case study of examples of previous reviews that they have undertaken for sports and leisure facilities across a number of local authorities throughout the British Isles. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. It has been suggested that um, there has been additional communication between the Minister and the team responsible for this um, review. If that has been the case, will material be provided in terms of what communications have taken place and possibly copies of that? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I've certainly had no direct communication with the company involved in the review. Supplementary, Mr. Glover. Here am I, Dr. M. Will the Minister confirm who these stakeholders are that she refers to that are going to be consulted by the off island consultants? And will this include interested parties such as people who run swimming clubs, etc.? Minister to reply. Um, certainly, I'm happy to circulate again the terms of reference of the review, and um, obviously, you know, we'll take on board the comments made by the honourable member. But certainly, swimming clubs will have been utilising the pools, so it will be expected that they will look at the charges, etc., that have been getting utilised for the pools for these clubs to make sure that when they come forward with the outcome for the report that it's a fully intensive and the right um, understanding of what goes on in our pools which could be slightly different to the UK but certainly there's a number of clubs and set private companies that use the pools and that will have to be taken into consideration. Supplementary, Dr Hayward. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I wonder if the Minister could comment on what mechanism exists for either pool users as individuals or as families or as groups or we're organised <coughs> groups to feed into that and whether the consultants have been charged with going out and talking to those key stakeholders in the process. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, clearly, um, there's a short timescale for the outcome of this report to ensure that we've got a way forward from September. We are expecting the company to report by the end of um, July, and then it will go to the Council of Ministers for September. Um, I, I would not envisage a consultation to go down to individuals. Um, I'm sure that doesn't happen in any other review. Um, however, if anybody does have any comments that they wish to put into the review, they can certainly contact the department and make them known. Final supplementary, Mr. Glover. Am I, Dr. Ann, and I'll try again in the uh, vein of uh, Douglas uh, uh, North MHK and uh, Russian MHK. We're hearing quite a few people who are very interested parties, particularly at the Southern Pool, who want to have their say on this consultation. It would appear mm. from the answer and a straight yes or no that the stakeholders are only going to be the boards. Would the Minister confirm that? Crackers. Minister to reply. I certainly won't confirm that it's only the boards. The review is to take place by an external consultant and it is down to them to dig into dig deep into the current processes and come back with a report that covers every element of the swim pools, the regional pools, including the NSC, including Balakameen High School pool, and to ensure that that is a full, extensive review. My one final supplementary, Lorda. So would the Minister then just, just clarify what I think I've heard this morning, is that there's a review going on, it's going to be finishing within the next 13 days, um, the public and local members have not been identified as key stakeholders. It's going to be done by somebody off Ireland who ha perhaps has very little experience of the Ireland context, and that's how this is going to work. And she finds that acceptable. I've just found that crack oh. extra in. Minister to reply. No, certainly that is not the case. We will, I will make sure, as the minister, that the people that need to have input into this extensive review are part of it. Now, whether that's individual meetings with the consultants, I can't confirm that here, in, here today, but I'm happy to circulate the terms of reference for the review that were put out, um, which all honourable members, I'm happy for you to all view them, and um, certainly there was a tight time scale, and I want to make sure this is done appropriately, and obviously under our procurement process as well, um, but the stakeholders for that for the southern pool are mainly is the board it's the boards that have come to come to us with concerns and i am hopeful that the boards will have a good measure of the users of their pool move on to question eight i call on the honourable member for arbury custom mr morehouse thank you mr speak president i would like to ask the minister for education sport and culture when her department last considered the importance of school uniform policy and the impact of school uniform costs on family budgets. Thank you. Gervais Shock, uh, Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. The Department of Education, Sport and Culture recognises the importance of school uniforms in creating identity and a sense of belonging, whilst allowing for a common dress code not driven by fashion or social status. Schools are currently permitted to make decisions and formulate their own policies with regard to the detailed nature of the uniform in conjunction with their governing body and have well-developed practices and guidance for pupils and parents. Schools are mindful of the financial burden that uniforms can place upon families and parents are encouraged to approach schools and the head teacher if they are experiencing particular difficulties. Schools will then support parents in exploring options. Other options are available that include pre-loved uniforms, using funds available from third sector providers and dedicated funds held by the department. To help address equality issues around secondary school uniform policy and reduce the cost of school uniform, which can be seen as a barrier to participation in learning, the department will launch a consultation in due course. The consultation will be open to anyone with an interest in secondary school uniform policy and primary, but especially pupils, parents, carers, educational professionals, schools, and those who provide school uniform items. The views gathered from this consultation will inform future policy and guidance development and help to shape new uniform policy principles which will underpin individual schools' uniform policy. 
Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. Um, I appreciate the information on the support that can be given to families who are struggling with the uniforms. Could that be made available on the website? Because that is something that historically I've known has been an issue, and that additional information would be good. Um, in terms of the cost to buy a new school uniform, it's over £300. Have any schools raised concerns about these costs, and has the department discussed this with um, Social Security in terms of it being an underlying issue that potentially could be looked at and solved? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and I do encourage, um, if the Honourable Member knows of any families that are, encourage them to contact the schools or the department um, to see what support is available. With regards to contact and social security, um, there are, are organisations like social workers that can support families as well. Um, we haven't directly contacted social security regarding the uniform costs. What we've done as a department is discuss with our head teachers and make sure that they are having a uniform policy that is affordable to families. I'm not sure um, where the costs of the £300 have come from, but I've certainly done a little bit of research with our secondary schools today, and uh, a blazer is about £27, and certainly the item of uniform at the largest secondary school that's required for PE is £12.50. So I'm not sure, I can, I can understand that perhaps it's £300 if there's a number of students um, attending a school. Um, however, I'm not sure where that figure has come from. Um, but certainly our schools will work with all parents to make sure that the uniform's affordable. We will consult because we need to make sure that we have the views of all who would be impacted. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Wilhouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, one of the best elements of the first answer was that recognition of the importance <coughs> of the school uniform. When children returned to school on the 15th of June 2020, there was an easing off in terms of the uniform requirements. Is it now seen in all schools that going forward in September 2023 that the school uniform policy will be pushed as a priority? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Obviously, our school leaders are best placed to understand the needs of their individual settings. And certainly in my previous life, when blazers were introduced at Balakamune, I think it was around about 97, um, there was a purpose behind that to ensure that um, there was no peer pressure from, from others and it was to identify the school and the ethos of the school, which I'm sure the Honourable Member is very aware of as well, of the importance of that. But, but ultimately, it's, it is the decision on the school uniform policy ahead of this current academic year. It's placed with the head teachers in the schools. Um, however, we will look at that going forward and I'm happy to invite the Honourable Member to come in and support on that. <laughs> Honourable members, we uh, move on to um, question nine, and uh, these are a few questions coming to the Minister for Enterprise. I have had a request uh, that uh, the member for uh, Enterprise, Mr Johnson, take those questions, along with item 42. Is the court content? Agreed. Thank you. So we now move to um, question nine, and the, I'll call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. And I'd like to ask the member for the Department for Enterprise what progress has been made with Laxey Wheel restoration, when it will reopen, what further work will be required, and if he will make a statement. I want the member, Mr Johnson, to reply. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the honourable member for her question. Um, I've been advised by Mags National Heritage that the work to repair and conserve great, the Great Laxey Wheel typifies the opportunities and challenges faced by heritage organisations in ensuring that assets in their care are maintained for future generations. This work requires a bespoke approach to maintenance and repair through a deep understanding of the history and traditional construction. Considerable work has therefore been undertaken on the Lexi Wheel, some of which has only been possible to, has only possible to identify following the erection of the scaffolding and commitments of work. This has understandably led to delays to repairs which are now due to be completed in full for phase one by the end of August, subject to resolving a technical issue with the wheel case. The broader Laxey wheel site has not been closed to visitors during the conservation work, so will not need to reopen. However, removal of the scaffolding will commence imminently, which will allow the wheel to be revealed. Whilst the work has been taking place, 
Special hard hat tours have been arranged to assist in promoting understanding of the significant work being undertaken and the challenges faced, which I am aware the Honourable Member, Mrs Kane, has attended. National Heritage recently invited all uh, members of Timbald for a behind-the-scenes briefing at, at Laxey Wheel, which has now taken place. At MNH, extend their thanks to those members who attended. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mrs. Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. And for the record, I tabled the question before I received that kind invitation, and, and very much enjoyed it, except for the horsefly bite. Um, <laughs> I'd. He, he mentioned, um, Honourable Member, will be aware that the impact on Laxey and the various businesses within the village has been significant, having its major tourist attraction under wraps for most of this season, just as we're coming out of two years of the pandemic. So would his department acknowledge that there is a significant impact on the e econom economy of Laxey? Um, and a couple of other points. Would he suggest then that the wheel will be turning as well as unveiled by the end of August? And what further work is going to continue next year? Is he also aware how significantly visitor numbers have been impacted? Does he know, for instance, what the normal visitor um, numbers would be at the wheel compared with this season? Because I'd suggest that they're very much down. And however excellent, interesting and informative the hard hat tours are, they are very minimal in terms of the numbers of people who can benefit from them. So there has been a significant impact and I think there was a phase two to come. Can we, can we reassure people that the wheel to all intents and purposes will be open and turning and able to become the iconic attraction that Laxey has benefited from for at least uh, 150 years? Thank you, Mr. President. Member to reply. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you on the road for that very long question. <laughs> um, I think to start with, um, uh, as far as business, uh, to my knowledge, the department hasn't been contacted uh, by any businesses in that area, but, um, but, but they do, I do suggest that they reach out to the business agency. Um, the, the department doesn't tend to financially support uh, businesses which have been impacted by the closure of, of attractions. However, there is external consultancy and a range of other support that the department may be able to provide. So I would suggest that uh, if anyone does have any issues, they do uh, contact the department on that. Um, as far as when the actual wheel will be turning, um, I don't have that information, but I, will, I shall find that out for you. Um, what I can say um, is that yes, phase two will be, will be starting soon. Um, there's a tender process going out for that at the moment. Um, and we're hoping that um, that work on, on that will start in August um, with the completion for next March 2023. Um, I can't think what else you, the question you, you asked now. Um, as far as um, that extra work that needs doing, I think what I can say is there is, is that uh, there will be more work to do, absolutely. They're looking at replacing at, at this stage around about a third of the, of the wheel buckets and, the, and, the, and the, the, the wheel rims, but there's another two thirds to do. Um, and that will be getting done over a period of si over a six year period um, with minimum scaffolding, so that shouldn't, that shouldn't really affect, hopefully, the, the day to day operations and, and it as, a, as a visitor attraction. Um, as far as visitor numbers are concerned, again, I don't have that information, but I will be able to get that to you. Okay. Thank you. Supplementary, Dr. Allenson. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank the um, Honourable Member for Department of Enterprise for his comprehensive answer. Would he agree with me that conservation and repair work on something as iconic as the Lady Isabella should not be rushed, should be done very carefully, and in the professional manner it's been handled by Manx National Heritage? And I also would like to thank him for his assurance that this is the start of ongoing work that's being done to keep the Lady Isabella turning, not just now, but into the future. Thank you. Member to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the honourable his, uh, his uh, comments. Um, absolutely right, and I appreciate this is this is taken longer than, than we expected. But again, I think it is important to ensure that it is done properly. You know, there have there have been issues um, which have caused delays. The, the original four-month programme has has been extended to sort of seven months. Um, clearly, there's been material disruptions with with ongoing issues globally. Um, obviously, again. Work can't be done in inclement weather. It's quite difficult, and and also it's making sure that the, the unique masonry and, and the paint finishes that are there, there are our issues. Making sure the paint is, uh, is 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 correct. Again, this is taking a bit of time, but 
I think that's the important point is actually it's really important to do this properly, get it right, and then it's, it's right for the future. Here, here. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'm very grateful to the Minister and the Minister for, for Treasury for his intervention. Um, would the Member for Enterprise agree with me when he speaks about the bespoke approach to maintenance, it is very important that adequate budget is allocated to our heritage organisation to ensure ongoing and routine maintenance <coughs> is undertaken in a timely way and that the major uh, restoration such as this one, which has come <coughs> along maybe every 40 years, that we avoid unnecessary deterioration by adequately investing in our heritage assets. Thank you, Mr. President. Member to reply. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I, I would agree. Um, I think we have to see this as a long-term investment. This is when we, when we look at the visitor strategy, the importance of attracting more people to the island. These sites are incredibly important. They're a part of our heritage, and it's incredibly important that we look after. Yeah, yeah. Final supplementary, Mr. Wannenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I thank, the sorry, I thank the member for his uh, information so far. Could he tell me uh, how much the cost of this refurbishment is? Thank you. Member to reply. What I can tell, thank you, Mr. President. What I can tell the mm -hmm. member is that the, the cost of phase one, um, the, the range at this stage is between 560 and 650 thousand pounds. I haven't got the final figure yet. That's still under review. Um, and then phase two, I can't give a price on that at the moment because that's out to tender so at this stage. So it would be inappropriate to put any figures in at this stage. We move on to question 10. I call on the Honourable Member for Russian, Dr Hayward. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I should like to ask the Member for Enterprise whether the Green Living Grant Scheme assessment software supports the removal of fossil fuel boilers and their replacement with low carbon alternatives. Member for Enterprise to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I might thank the Honourable Member for her question. Um, I would like to thank the Honourable Member for her question. The Green Living Grant Scheme was launched in October 2021 and provides financial support for up to £6,000 in the form of Manx home energy audits and grants towards energy improvement schemes. In order to help reduce carbon emissions from domestic properties, which in, in turn assists the government's target on the Isle of Man being carbon neutral by 2050, due to global fuel cost rises and the associated increased cost of living, the scheme was modified in April 2022 to remove the priority order in which works must be completed to enable additional flexibility for applicants. It is important to note, though, that only works listed on the Manx Home Energy Audit report are eligible for grant support. To date, the scheme has received 1,860 applications, 1,829 of which have been authorised for Manx Home Energy Audits and 1,003 initial audits completed. 74 grant applications have also been received. As the scheme progresses, and increasing numbers of grant applications are, are being received, a number of policy matters have been identified which are being considered in conjunction with the Climate Change Board. To answer the specific question raised by the Honourable Member, the software underpinning the Manx Home Energy Audit report does not appear to recommend replacing fossil fuel boilers with low carbon alternatives such as ground source air and air source heat pumps. This is according to the data the department has seen so far. It appears that these items are not being recommended by the auditing software as the parameters for the recommendation of these uh, products are very narrow. Normally for a Manx Home Energy Audit to, re to recommend low carbon heating alternatives, the property must be very well insulated and meet other criteria which would, would generally mean that the property would already be <coughs> highly uh, rated in terms of energy efficiency and therefore ineligible for funding under the scheme. The department is working closely with the Climate Change Board to regularly review the scheme, respond to queries and adapt the scheme where possible to meet the needs of the applicants and broader government policy in respect to climate change. <coughs> Supplementary, Dr Hayward. Thank you. Some of the home energy assessors have been in to see some of my constituents and they've been suggesting to those homeowners that their fossil fuel boilers should be replaced with new fossil fuel boilers, uh, but not with anything else. And, and, and I take on board the points about how well insulated the home is. But does the, the member appreciate that actually these assessments and the subsequent suggestions that we make need to be in line with decarbonisation decarbonization that's needed to achieve net zero? And uh, will there be further modifications to this to drive the system in that direction, please? Member to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I, I, I hear what the member says, and I think, 
think the situation is, as far as I understand this, my limited information, is, is that uh, the software package actually that, that it's quite limited and narrow in, it, in its appraisal, and it, it tends to throw up this as, as an option. Um, when, when actually it's not appropriate, we, uh, we, as a government, we know the, the commitment has been made to, to net zero 2050, and therefore that's that's not that's not considered uh, appropriate. What I can say is is that the uh, as I say, around about 90% of the of the audits that have been done so far on properties, most of those properties are sort of grade D and below. Um, so the important thing there is, is it's looking at the fabric first, is, is what's really important. The, the main aim here is to make sure that we are increasing those properties' energy efficiency first and foremost, because at this stage, uh, a more efficient boiler would be would really not be efficient at all. So that's at this stage. Move on to question 11. Call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. I beg to ask the Member for the Department for Enterprise what engagement his department has had with businesses and what support is being provided to ensure customers can both access and use cash for purchases. Call on the Member for Enterprise, Mr Johnson, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. And may I thank the Honourable Member for his question. As Honourable Members are aware, the findings of an access to cash report commissioned by the Department was presented to this Honourable Court at its January sitting. In this report, a number of recommendations for further attention and an analysis were identified, many of which related to the use of non-cash-based processes in businesses and the availability <coughs> of cash for cash-based purchases by customers. I have not been made aware that there are, are any immediate issues with businesses accepting and customers wishing to make cash payments. The Department, through Finance Isle of Man, continues to have a close working relationship with the Isle of Man banking sector. The Department recently hosted a roundtable discussion on the subject of the continued reduction in the number of cash transactions on the island. The Department is currently is continuing to monitor the situation in regards to the availability of ATMs and broadband rollout to aid with non-cash transactions. Business Isle of Man will shortly be conducting a survey across businesses in the relevant sectors to identify if there are, there are any specific barriers being, being seen or felt around cash-based transactions. This survey will include an assessment of the levels of cash taken by businesses, looking to understand how it is banked, and also review opportunities and sentiment around enhanced cashback services. The findings of this survey will give a true indication of the situation and identify what the real-world issues with cash-based purchases, both from a business and customer position, are. Once the survey is complete and an assessment made of the results, the Department will look at what potential options are for targeted support that may be needed to facilitate better access to cash if this is a problem. As I mentioned earlier, I have not been made aware that there are any immediate issues with businesses accepting and customers wishing to make cash purchases or non-cash purchases for that matter. If honourable members have any specific information related to issues around cash purchases, then I will be more than happy to pass these to the relevant officers for action. Supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank the Honourable um, um, Member for the Department um, for that comprehensive answer. Um, he says that he's not aware of any issues, so let me make him aware of some, Mr President, um, right here and now. Um, I've been contacted by quite a few individuals who are reliant on cash for various different reasons, um, where they are now finding, particularly in retail and hospitality settings, that businesses' acceptance of cash has actually declined and they are actually preferring card payment, which is quite understandable for the business um, because it is actually easier for the business and they're not having to handle cash, but it is causing issues. So while the member has focused very much on the, in the answer on access to cash, that's all well and good, but would the member agree with me that once you have that cash, you have to then be able to use it and there needs to be more engagement with business to understand the barriers that is being caused to those businesses being willing to accept cash um, as we move forward. Member to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and may I thank the uh, honourable member for his response. Um, I don't disagree. I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, I think it's very important to make sure that uh, <coughs> as we go through this transition, I think, which is fair to say, we are going through a transition away from cash. That we, we we don't leave anybody behind. And that's that's incredibly important. And I think as part of this process and as part of the access to the cash report. That very much has that at its heart to ensure that uh, it's, it's relevant across across the whole of our society, and certainly the work that's going on uh, with the with the actions, and, and certainly the work that's going on with the departments, whether it's access to ATMs, 
digital education, looking at banking hubs, um, looking, looking at coverage, um, and maybe again, as, as changes happen with post offices, again, how, how we make sure that there's still access. All, all these things are very important and uh, need, to be, need to be considered going forward. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. <clears throat> thank you, Mr President. Um, thank you for these reassuring answers. The problem is that, is this happening within government? There was an issue several months ago in terms of engagement, and DOA decided to remove the cash option for their tenants. Was it something that was raised by Enterprise at the time? Thank you. Member to reply. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I think the answer to that is no, it wasn't raised by, by Enterprise at the time. I think, I think that the point is what, what Enterprise has been engaged in is that broad uh, survey across not just government but across the whole of, of our sector, the whole of the economy, to ensure that, uh, that people, as I say, aren't being left behind and, and that they, they still have access to, to what they need. And that's something that, again, as I said, mentioned earlier, there will be a transition away from cash, but we must make sure that we are taking everybody with us and we are not leaving any, on anybody behind on that journey. Supplementary, Dr. Allison. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank the, the member for the Department for Enterprise for his answers and for his reassurance that a widespread consultation is going to be taking place to assess the impact of cash and the use of it in our society. Would you agree with me that really it's up to small businesses to decide how they accept payment? Whilst some will only accept cash, increasingly some will only accept card. Um, we need to understand the reasons for that. Sometimes it is convenience, but as the Honourable Member for Douglas North knows, sometimes that's those um, firms that only take cash um, are a little bit of a concern and so I'm glad that his department is looking into the reasons for this to facilitate payments for all the people on our, on our island. Thank you. Member to reply. Thank you Mr President. I, I thank the Honourable Member for his comments and I fully agree with what he said. Final supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And would the Honourable Member for the Department agree with me that, of course, it is entirely at the behest of any business what they do, but that as we move through the transition, as the Honourable Member says, um, it is important that people aren't left behind, and in fact, that the lack of ability to be able to use cash once accessed can actually cause social exclusion for some. And while it might be a small minority, it's actually generally a very vulnerable minority of individuals. Um, so would the Honourable Member agree, agree with me that in light of his original answer, and I welcome the fact there will be further engagement, will he pledge that that engagement will not just be around access to cash, which has been very much the focus of the answer, but specifically the use of cash as well, and understanding what barriers and for what reasons businesses may be refusing use of cash? Member to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I, I'm perfectly happy to take those comments on board from the Honourable Member. And, uh, and, and as I say, as part of the whole process, I think he's quite right what he's saying, and, and that needs to be part of the whole, the whole process going forward. Thank you very much. Move on to question 12. I call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs. Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to ask the Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture what her department's plan is to secure on island flower production. Colin Shabeshock, Minister for Environment, Food and Agriculture, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and thank you to the Honourable Member of Garth for the question. As the Court will be aware, the loss of Ramsey Bakery has brought into sharp focus the island's flour production and its long-term future. Ramsey Bakery took 80% of the flour produced from Laxey Glen Mills, and its closure has naturally had a significant impact on the business model of the mill. Given the mill's role in food security and as part of the Food Matters strategy, my department has recently provided support for Laxey Glen Mill to assess its future options through a paper. My department has held discussions with the Manx National Farmers Union to understand the concerns of their members, as well as a number of bakery businesses on Ireland to understand their long-term plans and also with milling wheat growers. However, the role for my department is a tricky one in this situation. Our aim is to support the wheat producers, but we are not shareholders or involved with the strategic direction or operations of Laxey Glen Mill. Whilst we are listening and keen to understand how we can support the island's wheat growers, we, like them, must await the outcome of the report and the agreed long-term plan for the mill. Regarding the security of on-island flour production, I understand that for at least the next 24 months this has a stable footing, with 1,300 tonnes of wheat available on island to be milled. The long-term plan for the mill will, of course, determine more clearly the longer-term future of flour production on island. The report is due in the next month, however, this is dependent on some external factors. 
The report will belong to the mill and the shareholders will need to consider, once it is received, what action will be taken next, including whether the report will be published. DEFA will, of course, work with Treasury and other stakeholders to ensure we get the right solution for our island. Thank you, Mr President. Move on to question 13. Call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. I beg to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care what plans there are to upgrade and expand respite facilities. Call on Shabeshot, Minister for Health and Social Care, to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. Manx Care has a range of respite services that are delivered directly and indirectly through third sector organisations. In regard to adult social care, respite is directly provided in three specific areas – learning disabilities, older people and dementia care. Learning disability respite is currently provided at Holly Dean Unit Radcliffe Villas in Douglas, where there are 10 beds dedicated to respite and one for emergency use. Holly Dean is unable to operate at maximum capacity as the building is no longer compliant with the Regulation of Care Act, and occupancy levels are based on risk and service user compatibility. The service is currently used by 52 adults with a learning disability. The construction of a new respite facility is included in the Isle of Man Government Capital Programme, with plans at an advanced stage to replace Radcliffe Villas and construct a purpose-built respite facility for adults with a learning disability. This new facility will increase the number of available beds to 12, but it will also enhance the current capacity levels, which are restricted by the limitations of the existing building. Respite for older people is available at various care home locations across the island, with four beds at Commonmore in Ramsey, four beds at Reetna Bay in Douglas, and two beds at Southlands in Port St Mary. Both Reetna Bay and Commonmore are no longer compliant with the Regulation of Care Act and will be replaced as part of the Isle of Man Government Capital Programme. Reetna Bay will be replaced by Summerhill View, currently under construction on the former Glenside site of the Governor's Bridge Junction in Douglas, whilst the planning application has been submitted for the replacement of Common Moor on the for former Coolnamary site in Ramsey. The new buildings will provide improved respite accommodation for older people. Respite for older people with dementia is provided at Sweetbriar Unit in Douglas, Reet Skyle in Ramsey and the Gansey Unit in Port St Mary, all of which have one respite bed. There are no current plans to further increase the current number of beds. Ramsey and District Cottage Hospital provides respite for seven service users who access the service two to three times a year each. The service at Martin Ward was closed to new patients in January 2018, as it was the view of the clinical team that receiving respite on a hospital ward is not appropriate. However, the Department of Manx Care have honoured the commitment for patients who have received this service for several years prior to closure. In regard to services directly provided as part of the Social Care Children and Families portfolio, T. Cargis or Ramsey Respite Centre provides seven overnight respite beds for children and young people with a disability. At present, this service is currently stretched due to having to accommodate several young people in Ramsey on a more permanent basis. Overnight respite for some families is temporarily reduced as a result. Additional resources are currently being sought to ensure Manx Care continue to support families in need of this provision. The Braddon Hub also provides respite care during the day, usually after school hours and holidays or weekends, to support families where children have a disability. A review is to be commissioned in the near future to holistically review respite services for children with disabilities on the island. And social care will then have a clear way forward as to how these services need to be expanded and upgraded. In addition to the services provided directly by Manx Care, two respite flats are commissioned with Leonard Cheshire Disability at T. Quinney in Ramsey. This service provides respite to adults aged 18 to 65 with physical disabilities and or complex neurological conditions such as an acquired brain injury. As part of the department's plan, the department intends to strategically review the overall provision of respite care on the island by undertaking a gap analysis later this year. Supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr President. Can I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive answer? Can I start by welcoming um, the proposals for Ratcliffe Villas? And can I thank the Minister for his engagement over that topic as well um, with, with, mem with members? Um, it's, it's a very important development and very, very welcome. Can I ask the Minister, are there currently, I know they, there's going to be engagement coming up, but are there currently any provisional calculations and what assessments have been undertaken around what future demand might actually look like? Has there actually been any of that work undertaken? I know there was some work planned pre-pandemic, but as with everything, it got put on hold. I was wondering if that piece of work has been picked up again. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. No, that is the gap analysis I referenced in my answer. So it's in the department plan to pick up that piece of work, make sure we understand what the need is across the island, and then from that, we'll build a strategic case to roll out, hopefully, increased respite provision uh, around the island geographically. 
Supplementary, Mr Ashford. Thank you, Mr President. Um, can I ask the Minister, and he may not have this to hand, um, and if not, would he be willing to circulate it? But I was wondering on how many occasions, say, over the last 12 months, the demand for respite has actually outstripped supply? Um, because I am aware of cases in the past where people have tried to access respite facilities for, say, for the, say, their disabled child, um, and they've been unable to do so um, because, their supply, because the, the actual supply hasn't been there. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I don't have those figures with me. I, I'm not going to offer to circulate that because I think my uh, expectation, exactly the same as the honourable members, is it will be every month uh, for the last 12 months that will have happened. Um, as I said in my original answer, there is a uh, the respite care for young people with a disability is currently very stretched because of uh, particular needs of some of the current residents, current children that are receiving care in the Ramsey Centre. Uh, that is hopefully an issue that will be uh, resolved as additional resources are sought to deal with it. Uh, so as much as I'd love to go and ask Manx Care to go away and do the work on that, I think it would be quite pointless because we already know what the answer is, that we do need more respite on the island, which is why we need to undertake this analysis to understand just how big the gap really is before we can then go out and talk about commissioning additional, additional space, additional respite care uh, to meet that demand. Supplementary, Mr Wannenberg. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the Chief Executive of Manx Care has told me that the provision of respite health care for children is not a priority. Could the minister tell me when it will become one and what needs to happen for it to become one? Thank you. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Manx Care's priorities are determined by the mandate. Uh, that was the reason I brought the mandate, uh, three year proposals for a mandate to this honourable court for a debate to understand what members' priorities were. Uh, came through very clearly from that around a range of children's services. Children's respite care did not come out in that debate as being a, a need for a priority. But like I say, the department has already established that respite care is a priority for us, irrespective of the uh, views that were or were not expressed during that debate. It is going to be looked at as part of our island plan, department plan, that will be published in due course. Supplementary, Mrs. Sharp. Guramayu uh, Ekteren. Um, can the minister confirm whether this gap analysis, um, which he's talking about, is also going to look at numbers of staff for respite facilities, because I understand that it's not just the bricks and mortar that we need. It's not just bigger respite facilities. We also need the staff to work in them. How is he going to attract staff? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm not going to broaden this answer out to talk about staff. We have two wonderful questions coming up where we can explore that in detail. Uh, but yes, in, in simple terms, a gap analysis will have to look at demand, but also then how we meet that demand. When Manx Care talk about beds, they talk about staffed beds rather than they're not really talking about the physical location. They're talking about making sure those facilities are properly staffed at the same time. Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you, Mr. President. A uh, nice, easy question, hopefully, and hopefully the answer will be a yes. Um, would the Minister agree with me that when it comes to talking about respite care, and we know from his original answer because he laid it out in quite a bit of detail, a lot of the focus can sometimes be on respite for, the, for older people. Um, and then, in fact, actually, when he talks about things we all already know, most of the gap generally is around young people, and their parents can, and their families are the ones probably that need respite the most. Um, uh, because they come under the most pressure. So will the Minister undertake that any um, needs analysis is very much focused on the young people and the potential gaps there, rather than as sometimes happened in the past, where there's been much more of a focus around the older generation rather than the needs of the younger generation? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm more than happy to confirm that that will definitely be part of the work, um, ensuring we have that we're meeting the needs of everybody, I think, is, is key, uh, not focusing on any particular groups. And so, yes, the needs of younger people, their families, carers, will all be taken into account. Supplementary, Mr Henderson. <coughs> Would the Chauffeur Shock um, give the court some indication of how long this, uh, what sounds like hugely complicated gap analysis, will take to uh, complete? And when will we see some additional uh, respite beds for younger people. And returning to the Honourable Member for North Douglas's supplementary question, Mr. Wallenberg, the issue may not have been raised in the uh, debate that the Schweizer mentioned, but it's been raised here now in Tinmore Court. Yeah, yeah. Would he agree and undertake to take that point away and build it into this uh, issue that's been raised here this morning? Minister to reply. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, the department plan indicates at the moment a date of February 2023 to have that work completed. Um, that is only an indicative date at this stage. Obviously, the plan hasn't come to this honourable court. Um, and in terms of uh, prioritising, unfortunately, it isn't really possible to build a long-term strategic plan if your priorities are constantly shifting as a result of individual questions. That was the purpose of bringing the mandate debate here, to try and get a more holistic view as to what Timwald felt was important from Timwald's perspective. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure how you give Manx Care that strategic steer if every single week something else is coming up as a new priority that has to absolutely be dealt with uh, as a priority. The question will always be, well, what then do you deprioritise as a result? It needs to be looked at in a much bigger piece than simply on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. But I would like to reassure the Honourable Member for Council and this Honourable Court, like I've already said, this issue is already encapsulated in our department plan. It's already, uh, there is work already underway to start the process for how we're going to start solving the problem that we all know is there. Uh, it isn't something that's going to fall by the wayside. Supplementary, Mrs. Sharp. Gurumai <coughs> Vectorin. Um, will the Minister acknowledge the fact that the reason why Ramsey Respite Centre is clogged up at the moment is that there are young people living in there permanently um, as a result of the fact that we do not have still enough accommodation for children um, who are in care or care leavers? Thank you. Mi Minister, to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Like I said in my original answer, the reason the Ramsey Respite Facility is currently uh, unavailable is because we have uh, young people in more permanent residence there. I'm not going to go into any more detail as to about the circumstances of those cases. We move on to question 14. I call on the Honourable Member for Russian, Lorda. Good morning, Director Ian. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care how many full-time doctors and nurses are in full-time employment within Nobles Hospital? what the expected establishment level is based on workforce planning and budget, what plans he has to improve the situation, and what his timetable is for doing so. Colin Chavishok, Minister for Health and Social Care, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Manx Care's structure is based on care groups, which aim to provide integrated care from combined hospital and community teams rather than specific locations. While some individual services or posts may be identifiable as hospital-based, it's not possible to run a report based on posts or staff groups' physical locations, such as Nobles Hospital. I can advise there are 240.66 budgeted full-time equivalent posts for doctors, of which 169.29, or approximately 70%, are filled. There are 576 spot 54 budgeted registered nurse posts, of which 439.33, or approximately 76%, are filled. Workforce planning is a key work stream of the Health and Care Transformation Programme Workforce and Culture Project. The project is currently in year two of a five-year delivery plan. There will be a systematic approach to undertaking workforce planning, the priority of which is determined by Manx Care. Currently work is underway with theatres and maternity services. The project team are cognizant of the fact that there are some decisions to be made about what services are delivered by Manx Care in the future, and that this will impact on workforce planning. The project team are ensuring that close links are maintained with Manx Care's board and executive team so the impact can be assessed and any changes to the approach agreed. In 2022-23, Manx Care aimed to recruit between 80 and 100 international registered nurses via a contract with GTEC, although it's important to acknowledge that many parts of the world are short of registered nurses and competition for these recruits will be intense. In 2023-24, Manx Care aimed to recruit a further 100 international registered nurses via GTEC. Manx Care are also committed to growing their own team. To this end, they have offered places to 29, Isle of, 28 sorry, Isle of Man residents to commence pre-registration nurse training on Ireland in September this year. Manx Care are also intending to adopt digital technology in delivery of academic studies to help Manx Care increase further the numbers of trainees it can accommodate via Kildare. In addition to work around registered nurses, Manx Care are also exploring international recruitment for midwives and are exploring ways midwifery trainees can access training and receive bursary support. <coughs> Supplementary, Lorda? Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the Minister for um, a very positive answer to, to that question. Um, there was in there um, talk about uh, future service decisions and whether um, Basically, Nobles Hospital is going to be able to do what it does now uh, long term into the future. Um, what's the timetable for getting those sorts of uh, decisions out of Manx Care in terms of planning going forward? I appreciate the, the growth in staff, but in terms of deciding what we will and won't be doing, those future service decisions, what's the timetable for that? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, that isn't a decision that's going to be driven by Manx Care. That's a decision that will be driven by the transformation projects inside the Cabinet Office and the Transformation Board. Um, work on that is ongoing. I can't remember off the top of my head what the deadline is, but I'll double-check that and I'll circulate the answer. 
supplementary, Laura. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the 28 nurses that have been trained on Ireland, that's obviously another really positive move in terms of bringing people through uh, locally into uh, really good jobs without them having to go off Ireland to train. Uh, was, does 28 represent the capacity, um, the absolute maximum capacity for um, Manx Care in the department to, for, for on Ireland training, or is there further scope there down the line? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My understanding is that does represent capacity at present, uh, Manx Care are working, like I said, on other mechanisms to see actually can we increase that capacity quite substantially to offer more training places to on island residents to try and encourage more people to take up nurse training on island. Supplementary, order. Thank you. Um, can I just ask also what the Minister is doing about making sure that staff are retained? Um, because as we all know, quite a lot of people have left the profession. The Department has, the Manx Care. Uh, has come from a difficult place in, in recent weeks, months and, and even years in this area um, in terms of that building morale, in terms of maintaining the, the current staff. Um, what's the Minister's master plan for that one? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, again, that is part of the workforce and culture piece of work that is being undertaken by Transformation uh, to see what can be done to, as well as training new uh, nurses, new registered nurses and new staff to see actually how can we encourage staff we already have to maybe retrain, expand what they do or even just to retain them in their current roles. Move to question 15 and I call on the Honourable Member for Russian Lauder. Thank you. Again, I'd like to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care. On how many occasions during 2022, Nobles Hospital has been unable to fully meet safe staffing levels as issued by the Nursing and Midwifery Council? What plans he has to improve the situation and what his timetable is for doing so, please? Paul and Shop, Minister for Health and Social Care, to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The Nursing and Midwifery Council are a professional regulator and do not issue safe staffing levels. I'm therefore not able to answer the question being asked as there are no such NMC safe staffing levels to compare Manx Care staffing against. However, to try and assist honourable members, I am able to advise that Manx Care would view any instance where staffing levels are lower than planned as being potentially unsafe. Where this occurs, Manx Care takes action to minimise adverse impact on patient care as far as reasonably possible. Planned registered nurse staffing levels are determined using a recognised acuity and dependency tool, accounting for the level of bed occupancy and workload in the clinical area, and uses the Safer Nursing Care Tool developed by NICE and the NHS National Policy Board to inform establishment requirements for each acute inpatient ward. This was last updated in November 2021. Manx Care monitor nurse to patient ratios at least three times a day to assess safety of staffing and monitor actual registered staffing hours against planned registered nurse staffing hours on a monthly basis to give assurance of safer staffing levels. Actual registered nurse staffing hours have been lower than planned for every month in 2022 for at least some clinical areas. Being short of staff does not necessarily mean staffing is unsafe. Staffing contingencies are used to mitigate risks where there are known shortages of staff, for short notice absences and in the event of a surge in demand for care. These contingencies help to, to mitigate potential harm for service users and include proactive electronic rotor planning and leave planning, aiming for roughly six to eight weeks in advance, judicious use of bank and agency shifts to cover identified gaps in rotors, redeployment of registered nurses on a shift by shift basis to minimize safety risks across the service, this means staff moving between wards and clinical areas to help stabilise rotors. Redeployment of non-ward-based registered nurses where possible to provide cover during a critical shortage. Many colleagues have been allocating time to provide cover. As a last resort, Manx Care will look to reduce bed capacity, if possible, to help concentrate staffing at levels which can support patient need. This would mean closing beds or wards for a period of time to stabilise staffing deficits. Always, though, professional judgment is applied from senior nurses, which usually involves accepting a level of risk in order to maintain a core service. In respect of plans to improve the situation, I think I've already outlined recruitment and training plans in answer to the last question. Supplementary, Lord. Thank you. So is the Minister therefore confident that there's never been a, a time when uh, patient safety has been put at risk due to unsafe uh, low levels of staff? And in terms of the, the knock-on effects of some of the... Uh, things that the Minister has said about sort of closing wards or, or stopping other services. Um, I presume that there is a level of impact assessment around that within Manx Care. Uh, to what extent is that reported to him directly as Minister in terms of making sure that a safe and viable service is actually happening up at uh, Nobles Hospital on a day-to-day -day basis? Minister to reply. Uh, thanks very much, Mr President. Uh, so I did confirm in the original answer uh, that actually there is always a level of risk associated with accepting staffing levels in order to maintain a core service. That is a professional judgment applied by senior staff on the ground, not by the department. 
In terms of what the department is made aware of, uh, obviously we are in regular contact with Manx Care. They do keep our quality and safety team uh, advised of potential issues, especially around uh, COVID-related related issues, for example, in terms of pressure on the hospital. Um, but that is monitored then by our QNS team as part of our regular monitoring processes. There isn't something separate that we do above and beyond our normal assurance work. Supplementary, Lord. No, thank you. And given the, the significance of shortage, we're talking about almost a quarter of vacancies being unfilled um, within nursing staff and 30% um, with uh, doctors. Um, is the minister actually considering having a conversation with Max Care about suspending any service lines to ensure that um, there's resilience elsewhere uh, in the hospital and in the wider health service? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, no, I'm not. Manx Care are uh, managing through the contingencies that I've already identified in terms of what they're able to do, providing services safely. Um, I think Manx Care are managing that relatively well, but evidenced by the fact that we aren't seeing widespread closures of wards, beds or services across the piste. And so, to my mind, that is a very operational matter that, at the moment at least, I'm happy to leave Manx Care managed, seeing as it's not seeming it to develop uh, problems for us on the outside. Move on to question 16. Call on the Honourable Member for Arbury, Castletown and Maloo, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure what progress has been made towards implementation of the Landlord Registration and Private Housing Act 2021. Call on Shavesha, Minister for Infrastructure, to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The package of me measures to implement this Act includes minimum standards, tribunal rules and an occupancy <coughs> deposit scheme each of which is reflected within the Housing and Community Board's 2022-23 Action Plan and the Department of In Infrastructure's work stack. It is the intention to develop an occupancy deposit, deposit scheme this year and to have consulted upon the minimum standards within the same time frame. This involves as wide as en engagement as possible and will include focus groups. I look forward to updating honourable members in due course. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. I'm rather concerned that the former minister gave a very similar answer, almost word for word, in December 2021, and he spoke about things taking place in the new year. You're talking now about before the end of the year. It seems to be pushing out further and further and further. Is there any definite place that we can say this will happen before. I recognise we're coming to the end of the parliamentary year, but there's a lot of concern out there. Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm not sure the, uh, the former minister can have given the same answer because this, uh, this answer had clear reference to actual work streams in the Housing and Communities Board 2022-23 Action Plan, which wasn't uh, published until um, after the date that the uh, questioner answered. The work streams that were identified in that uh, housing and communities work stream in the Department of Infrastructure work stack around minimum standards, occupancy <coughs> deposit scheme and tribunal rules are now um, started and being taken forward for completion. And I have no reason at this moment to expect them not to be completed in the time frame identified in that um, document. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for that clarification. In terms of the work stream moving forward, are landlords actually aware of these clear changes that the Minister refers to? There seems to be a lot of uncertainty in the sector, a lot of people are deciding whether it's worth staying in the sector. Has the Minister actually any indication of how many landlords are actually sold up and just through fear and just exhaustion about waiting for the, to see the final results? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, um, Mr President. I've been doing everything I can to make sure that landlords um, and also tenants uh, know where we are and know that the, um, the, uh, the apparent fear of minimum standards is, uh, and, 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 the, and, and the alleged discussions behind closed doors are just um, 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 myths in, in the la latter case. And in terms of the fear, there's something that needs to be explored further as, uh, as consultations go onwards. To answer the specific questions that the, uh, that the questioner asked, between 2011 and 2021, According to census data, the number of private tenanted property, the percentage of private tenanted properties increased from 16 to 18 per cent. It went up, it didn't go down. And um, secondly, there are landlords who are selling, but there are also um, properties in construction for um, tenanting. So we need to uh, 
one action of the uh, Housing and Communities Board is to get inside, um, inside those numbers more so that we can actually have policy based on evidence and law and financing and practice based on evidence. Commentary, Ms Farragher. Where am I, Rector Ren? Um, given the drive to attract external workers to the island and retain those that we have, coupled with England's recent push to rapidly improve tenants' rights, does the Minister not envisage potential harms in the implementation delay as the gap grows between the standards in force here and the standards implemented in England and Wales? Thank you. Minister to reply. Um, well, standards... Uh, in, what's, in what respect? Certainly, there are substantial differences between um, standards in various, in some as, in some uh, situations, but not in uh, others. And uh, certainly, as part of the consultation, um, that allegation um, will, you know, will be explored, um, will be explored further. The crucial point is the legislation is has now got royal assent, but is not is not yet. Um, implemented because the regulations haven't been made so the level of uh, standards that will be imp that will be uh, adopted in the in the island man has not yet been established so this is all based on uh, on um, hearsay allegation <laughs> supplementary mr callister thank you mr president and can i thank the minister for a statement this morning can i ask the minister when members and more importantly landlords will be have sight of the guidelines and the secondary legislation can i also ask the minister when he will also um, give sight to the deposit scheme how it will work and what engagement that will have with the landlords and tenants as well who will have to use that scheme and can I also ask the Minister, when was the last time the DOI Minister met with the Landlords Association and landlords in respect of this item? Minister to reply. Um, I, I haven't uh, met with the Manx Landlords Association. I, I do uh, recall attending a, 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 a public meeting that they uh, organised. Um, that was my last specific contact. I think I do know every member of the Manx Landlords Association Committee and have regular um, correspondence live on the radio or on the telephone and so on. It's an important group, but it's not, um, it's not the whole... Uh, it's not the whole... Um, doesn't re necessarily represent everybody that's concerned in this space. In terms of minimum standards and occupancy deposit scheme, I've laid out very clearly the whole process begins with consultancy focus groups that will then lead to uh, policy decisions which will lead to drafting and um, honourable members of this court and the general public uh, are encouraged to get involved with the, uh, the um, engagement and then subsequently with uh, consideration of the of the draft uh, documents when they're produced and, and the expectation is that they will uh, they will uh, be finalized in the middle of next year move on to question 17 and i call on the honorable member for arbury castletown malou mr morehouse thank you mr president i would like to ask the minister for infrastructure if we'll make a statement on the closure of the airport on the 16th of june 2022 thank you Paul on Shop, Minister for Infrastructure, Thank to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. A security incident was declared at the Isle of Man Airport on the morning of the 16th at approximately 6.10am. The nature of the incident led to the evacuation of the airport. Security and emergency protocols were put in place and the Isle of Man Constabulary led a multi-agency response to the incident. After an assessment of the risk, the incident was declared over later that morning at approximately 10.10am. Airport security staff followed their internal procedures to allow the airport to, re to reopen at approximately 1100 hours. Due to the nature of the incident and the sensitivity in relation to security matters, I hope that the Honourable Member will understand that I cannot give any further details at this time. However, I can confirm that all relevant agencies have taken part in a full debrief of the incident and a number of areas for future development have been identified in relation to training, processes, supervision of staff and communications. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. I'll try and stay, keep that in mind. In terms of the controlled nature of the incident, why wasn't the main A5 road opened after 90 minutes? It appears to be a carefully managed situation, and that possibility must have been considered. Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Um, I hope the uh, honourable questioner and the wider public understand that the uh, 
that there is an executive review, and I will make an announcement in terms of some learning from that executive review. We start with the debrief, but it would be wrong in this place or anywhere else at this stage to get into operational detail of what happened in those hours of the emergency. Final supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. In terms of that review, can an actual consideration be made of the areas affected? Um, Derby Haven seemed to be a priority, whereas King Williams College and Balthane seem to be ignored in terms of the potential impact. And also, in terms of the cost, is that being paid for by the airport itself or by some other area? Thank you very much. Minister, to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, say, I did make a I did make a commitment at the time uh, that there would be this executive room, not a public review, not, a, not an inquiry or anything like that, just a, a debrief and then learning from the debrief and that's what's going on. So measures that are likely to result um, will be determined by what risks are apparent in the airport and in the wider area on a safety first basis. Throughout, of, of, throughout any prolonged incident, a dynamic risk assessment approach has to be taken, undertaken, and measures are appropriate according to that dynamic risk assessment. All that sort of thing will have been, will have been reviewed as part of the debrief of the operation of emergency procedures. And I can absolutely assure this honourable court and the wider public that I work particularly with the Department of Home Affairs to, to make a statement in respect of an executive review of the debrief and the review of the emergency procedures and their implementation. Well, one more. Uh, supplementary, Mr. Wannenberg. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, could I ask the Minister, could the closure, the ongoing closure of the airport on that day be due to a shortage of staff? And does the Minister agree with me that the chronic shortage of specifically air traffic control officers has come about as a consequence of the actions of the previous airport director and the former chief executive of the DOI? Who swept, the carpet, who swept these issues under the carpet and did not rec um, recruit um, the required number of trained controllers over the last 10 years. Thank you. That's outside the scope, but uh, if the Minister wishes to comment. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, indeed, the, uh, the past and the future of air traffic control and indeed of the whole airport is something that's of fundamental, paramount importance to us all. For 30 years, off-island travel has been uh, an issue that's unfortunately listed most often by people as one of the top three things that are problematic with living on the Isle of Man. There are great things, but that's one of the issues that affects us, and that's uh, under review um, at the moment, but that's, not, that's separate from this uh, executive review of the incident. The, uh, the, um, the, the questioner has floated a hypothesis, and I'm absolutely sure that the uh, debrief will have, uh, will have considered that hypothesis if it's at all relevant on a, on a risk basis to what actually happened. Move on to question 18. I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castamaloo, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure what bus funding's policy is on the provision of minibus services, whether drivers receive additional training for this, and what private hire services have been available from bus funding since the 1st of April 2022. Thank you. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Currently, minibus utilisation is based upon servicing requirements, including patient transfer services, school and educational transport, the demand responsive transport systems operating in the north, government staff transportation, and a small number of more traditional bus services on lightly used routes. There seems no formal policy for this process. Drivers are trained to fulfill their license requirements and service delivery specific to the work they are doing. In addition to route familiarisation, the range of specialist training provided includes first aid, therno chair, evac chairs, managing wheelchairs, manual handling, managing special additional needs and de-escalation training for health and education work. Since 1st of April 2022, and indeed prior to this date, private hire work has been accepted from a variety of sources based on driver and vehicle availability. I understand that private hire commissions are only accepted if there are trained driving staff and vehicles, vehicles available for the date and time requested, and they meet a vital need in our community for larger scale public transport. Vintage buses can also be provided for special occasions. 
Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Um, just with regard to that final section in terms of on-the-day bookings, will the Minister please go back and check that that is actually the case? Because I have, it has been suggested to me that people have received on-the-day bookings at a time when service buses have been cancelled due to um, staff shortages. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, to reply. Yeah, in, uh, I hope the uh, questioner and other uh, and the member of public has uh, has been satisfied with all of the information that's been coming out from the, from bus van in, in respect of driver availability, the causes of driver in, in, inability, cancelled services. I do think the bus uh, van in is doing a great job to look at itself and to work out its future um, from bottom up, and uh, thank them um, thank them for that and uh, and. Um, when we get more into the private hire work, which is very much low down in the ranking of priorities, I'm sure the um, council ministers and then uh, after the department's considered it fully, will uh, will um, make decisions about the future of um, of bus van in. Um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, <coughs> suggestions of use of buses. I do think we all ought to remember that we need evidence. So, for instance, I sit now looking at private hire buses picking up cruise passengers, but the common belief is that no private hire buses do pick up cruise passengers. So we do need to make sure we get up, we, we actually get the evidence in all of these situations rather than just, uh, ju just the suggestions. And the most important thing is bus vanning and the future of bus services in the island is top priority for all of us in the Department of Infrastructure, I think for everybody in this, uh, in this, uh, in this place and the wider public at the moment, uh, pretty close to the airport, and uh, we're doing everything we can to make fundamental change over the uh, next couple of months, if not weeks. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, <coughs> Minister, for that reassuring answer. The gem being your support for bus finding, which a lot will really see has been important. Um, in terms of the charging structure for the hiring of minibuses, is there actually a structure in place? Because there seems to be a variance in terms of what people charge, in terms of, I recently had a quote of £250 being given as a daily cost for a minibus hire. Is there a standard, or is it kind of something that does fluctuate in terms of what's happening within the company? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr President. I'll... Um I won't take at face value any sort of published list. I'll make sure that we take a, a, a sample month and actually look at the actual uh, data when we come to make decisions about um, private hire in the future. Now we'll move on to uh, question 19. Call on the Honourable Member for Arby Custom Malou, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Cabinet Office what support will be made available to families in receipt of free school meals during the 2022 summer holiday period? Thank you. Shop, Minister for the Cabinet Office to reply. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. The Cabinet Office has worked since the spring with the Department of Education, Sports and Culture in order to launch a pilot holiday activity and food scheme for the first time this summer. Um, and we've worked quickly to source funding, establish governance and the necessary buyers to offer that funding. The programme's aim is to enable community-led provision during the school holidays in the summer. It is targeted at those young people in receipt of free school meals with the aim of providing nutritious meals and activities over the summer holiday period. The programme is funded via soft drinks levy funding allocated to public health. Interested parties from, the community, from community organisations were invited to make a bid from the fund. The funding enables access to <coughs> activity schemes for free in addition to food. I am pleased, Mr President, to confirm that funding is being given to a number of organisations including the Children's Centre this summer. This will fund either new provision or increase access to existing summer holiday schemes. In addition, soft drinks levy funding will also be provided to the youth service to offer an increased offering, including food provision during the summer holiday. Children in receipt of free school meals can access these summer clubs for free. Promotion of this has already started, mainly through schools working with head teachers, although organisations participating in this um, and running these schemes are also promoting. Mr President, I need to be, be clear that whilst I am pleased that we have been able to lead the work to develop the community <coughs> offering, this is a pilot scheme and it will need to be evaluated. It is not intended to be the main means of supporting 
providing support to families on, on free school meals. This is and remains financial support through the social security benefits system. On the wider support, families in receipt of free school meals have received cash payments of up to £750 since April to help with the rising cost of living. This has been through direct and targeted financial support to families by way of the family support payments of up to £400 paid to families receiving child benefits and the energy support payments of £350 paid to those on income-related benefits responsible for housing costs. The Treasury Minister has also confirmed in this place last month in response to a question from the Honourable Member for Onken that the Council of Ministers is actively considering what further support should be provided to individuals and when. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary. Mr Mulhouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. I am sadly confused. On Friday afternoon's children break up for the summer holiday, um, the parents out there are questioning what has been said in terms of vouchers have been given previously. There's been an indication that something is happening, but what does this mean for a family in Castletown or a family in Kirk Michael? Is there going to be national coverage? Where is this assistance going to be available? And in terms of, are there going to be groups of children who don't qualify for this? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't think it has been signalled that there was going to be an intention to provide um, vouchers in the same way that was done in the previous summer period, which was at a time um, after, after COVID when people were not able to work. And so that was really the basis the time behind the initiative for issuing <coughs> vouchers. Um, it will be through, through the schools and through the individual groups that this will be made available. However, um, if people parents in different parts of the island you know, want, to, want to make contact either with their schools either or also with them the um, appropriate contact um, for the Cabinet Office in this regard and they can signpost where those schemes will be available. The um, resource has been uh, and the applications have been considered in terms of the particular areas where there's been an indication from the community to meet the need and also particularly through the youth services. So the span of that is geared up to cover the, the areas of, of, of most need, but we'll have to evaluate it, see what the take-up is, and see how that works. Supplementary, Laura. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a, a few points to pick up from the, um, the Minister's answer. Um, the public health initiative um, was required people to have groups and individuals to have um, their proposals in by the end of June. Uh, could I ask the Minister how many groups have submitted an application for, for this pool of funding? Um, and could I pick up on the, the, the question from Mr Moorehouse about what is the geographic spread of those applications? Are they um, out inside of Douglas or are they all around the island? And can the Minister advise how many children could be catered for under the applications that have been through and how many children are on free school meals so we could get, um, to use the earlier term, a gap analysis as to what the capacity is uh, compared to what's likely to be uh, delivered. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. And there have been um, four not-for-profit organisations who will receive funding, as well as the Islands Youth Services, to open up the scheme to more targeted areas of the island. It is across the island. It's not just in Douglas. And in setting the applications, it's been looked at in terms of the data as to the number of children on free school meals in a particular area, in addition to other factors such as looked after children and also perhaps children that have English as a second language as well to try and take that overall um, needs and, and assessment of that. Um, really, it's geared at the, both those community organisations and the youth services being best placed to reach those young people um, most in need of support. It will not get to every child who has free school meals. The tying in of this with activities is purposefully because actually those people who may need the support, there's a lot of benefit that they can get from also being involved in the activities too. Um, I'll have to circulate um, to the Honourable Member the point about the number who are on free school meals and the, uh, the, um, the scope within the um, particular groups that can provide this. Um, I would also have to have to, to, to see what has um, transpired in particular for those for those um, different areas and, and circulate that further. Clearly, though, because it's a pilot scheme and because this is linking in activities and food, it does have a you know it does have a bit of a focus on that where um, you know numbers does does become a relevant factor in terms of how those community groups can deliver this. But these schemes have been um, developed elsewhere. I think it's definitely worthwhile trying this to see if there's a way to get, get that, get that um, food provision activity to children. And it's definitely been the intention to get this out in the areas of the island that need it. But 
government needs help to deliver this. We can provide the funding, but the community groups and also the youth services provide a key role in, in delivering that. Supplementary, Mr Moore. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs President. I'm really quite concerned that you've come to the to us this morning and you've not got clarity on the number of children involved, the number of children who could benefit from this. Um, we've got some general information about four groups and the Island Youth Service, but in terms of the quality of what's actually happening from Friday this week onwards, there doesn't seem to be anything at all. Um, is the Minister actually aware of what is happening next Monday morning or will it start next Monday morning in terms of the rollout? How imminent is it? It still sounds to be very um, basic and still taking form. I think a lot of parents, having seen the closing date for the call for help being the 26th of June, they had that expectation something was going to happen. The government's been very supportive of, as you mentioned, you know, £6.3 million has been provided for local communities, local individuals. And we, we get to this point and a group with real need is not being overlooked but not being given the clarity they do need and I think that's the concern. I feel if we could have more clarity on what was available, more people would say thank you rather than at the moment saying what, is, what does this mean to me? So if you could give a little bit more information, what does this mean to me? But also, will it be expanded to those children not on free school meals who are actually requiring food over the summer holiday? Thank you Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll take the, the last point first. It's always been the intention of this scheme to look at addressing that gap for children who are on free school meals. It has never been the intention to look at the broader point that the Honourable Questioner raises, where he's indicating, you know, sort of what about people that aren't on free school meals. That has been the focus of this scheme. Um, as has been indicated in all the publicity and awareness around this, this is about. Um, organisations and individual groups and their provision that they can provide which is funded by government. The advice that I can give is that if, if um, parents, families want to find out what schemes are available to them soon in their particular area, they can email um, hafinquiries at gov.im. There is a dedicated um, email address and the team both in public health and in cabinet office that are, are looking at how this progresses and very, very happy to stand by and advise people. But in addition, um, head teachers will be advising through the schools what are available and also individual community groups will do that. The reason I, I mention this is because government is not itself running a standardised scheme that goes across the board so it will depend on what is available in individual communities. They may be running, running things for a certain period of time and that will be down to them. This is backed by funding um, from the um, sugar levy tax which is allocated to public health and the policy has been developed by Cabinet Office, and so we do rely on partners in, in the education department and community groups to, to roll this out. But I hope that clarifies for the Honourable Member how parents can find out what is available in their area if, they are, if they've not heard about it yet already through their, their school or individual community groups um, promoting it. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you. Mr President, could the Minister clarify for the House if there is enough budget for this programme, if all free school meal children wanted to access the programme, and if not, how does that address the gap that she spoke of? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Because this ties in with activities and not just food provision, as has always been the, the purpose of this initiative, it is you know, going to not be an easy thing to achieve to get this to everybody who is on free school meals. That has not been signalled as being the case. Um, free school meals and the, the previous voucher support, that is of course something that's come through the Department of Education. And this is something which is looking at addressing something which has not been addressed before actually by government. The point about holiday hunger and how you get to those families that are in need and are perhaps mm. isolated in different parts of the island, different communities has not been addressed before. I think it's worthwhile to look at this, look at how it's worked. Don't look at the, the negatives. Yes, there will be gaps. It's a very difficult thing for everybody, everything to reach everybody, but we can learn through this. I spoke to an officer just yesterday who said, we want to be involved in the evaluation. We are listening to the groups who've said this is difficult. And I've already said, well, we need to tweak this. We can. But the reality is we're not running something that is going to reach every child on free school meals. In fact, the free school meals um, matter itself is not designed to run through the school holidays. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Laura. Uh, can I add, um, whilst the Minister is sort of circulating information, will she um, 
please uh, include the cost of this scheme versus the, the cost of vouchers last summer. D don't get me wrong, this does sound like a good initiative in, in terms of it's more holistic than just food. And, and if it works, this is going to be great. I think this is just a matter of making sure that um, mm -hmm. members have some, some comfort because we're hearing about it, I think, for the first time today. Um, how is the Minister going to assess whether it's achieved its objectives in terms of making sure that too many don't fall between the cracks. It's going to be those who have the most chaotic lifestyles, who have the most um, difficult circumstances, who are going to be the least likely to go and fill in the forms to get the, the kids um, to these uh, provisions. How is she going to be able to um, monitor that? And can you, um, will the Minister also um, confirm whether this is for the entirety of the summer holidays? Because I think the, the uh, the call for um, applications talks about a minimum of four weeks, but are these all for the full six weeks of the, uh, the school holidays? Uh, thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. It's down to the individual groups and the youth services and their resources as to what they can deliver and manage. So government is not in a position to instruct those community groups to say you must run this for the entire six weeks. I think if we did this, and over stipulated rather than listening as to what would tie in and be possible, I think that people go, we can't do this at all. And um, in terms of the um, of evaluation, I think part of it will also be about listening to the people who maybe you know didn't you know didn't decide to go forward in an application as to what the barriers were in that. In terms of how this has worked out and um, reaching those children in particular need, this is why I was very happy actually when the youth services said look we're, we're happy to get involved in expanding what the youth services do and supplementing what they offer to offer food because actually it's quite often that those people are working in the youth services that are in, in fact are really providing sort of almost like a social social care role they know from the ground which families need to be helped and in some cases they were helping people quite informally so what we've done is we've backed it with funding there's ninety thousand pounds allocated to this I think, though, that the actual rollout of it is very tricky because it's reliant on other people. So I expect any evaluation <coughs> to take account of the community groups, how they felt with it, those people that maybe haven't felt able to continue with an application. And actually, now this is for the first time, I think we'll be able to talk to organisations about how they might be able to, to partner together to deliver it in the future if there's a bit more time. And I think that's the sort of um, you know, reflection that will, will take place in quite a prompt way. And then if it's worthwhile, we can tweak that scheme. That's the basis that officers and desks are working on. And I know that community groups will work on too. If it's worthwhile, we can do it again. And, and um, you know, if not, then we would probably just, uh, I don't know what we'd have instead, but at least, it, at least it's something. But it is different to the vouchers. For those children that need food, they're probably also not the type of kids to go out and, 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 and maybe get activities as well. So I think that this bottom-up approach, backing it with public funding with a policy that says let's help these communities, is a right way to go for now. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister, for the information. In terms of the 90,000, that's a very good starting point. In terms of that budget, will all that budget be used during the summer holiday? And in terms of any remaining funds, how will they be allocated? But also, in terms of going forward, um, there are still slight issues in getting the link to this information. Um, could that be put out clearly in terms of allowing the media and Google and local people to get this information? Because it's not quite as accessible as perhaps some of us would hope. Thank you very much. Minister to reply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be announcements soon. Probably just reiterate the previous points made about how parents can find out. But yes, it will be, it will be publicised. Um, I actually forget if you can repeat the other two questions. I will answer them, but I just need a prompt. Yeah, just in terms of the £90,000 budget, will all that be used for this purpose in this summer holiday? Thank you. Minister? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, it, it this largely depends on the take up of community groups and the youth services to deliver. If it was all used, I would be very surprised, to be honest, but I think it shows government's commitment in the same way that government has shown other commitments to addressing the cost of living for people. Um, and um, I think I think that's that's the that's the right thing at the moment. Thank you. Oh, and, and to do with the um, promotion, I think you know that that will be covered in, in future. Too. Thank you. Supplementary, Ms. Farragher. Good morning, Director. And um, I do welcome this scheme and, and the uh, intention behind it, and thank the minister for all the information 
given today. Could the Minister confirm, um, please, if the scheme will apply to children of secondary school age who receive free school meals? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, where there are groups, including youth service, I think that would be the main one for older, older teens, where they receive free school meals, they will be eligible. Um, any remaining funding from the sugar tax allocation would probably still stay in the public health funds. Mr Mulhouse mentioned that before. I'm just taking a chance to answer that as well. Previously, that fund has been used for other health and wellbeing initiatives. I think it's also been used, for example, for um, the breastfeeding initiatives within, within um, Manx Care. So I just want to say, if that money is not used for this scheme, I'm quite sure it's going to be used for other worthwhile causes within public health and the wellbeing agenda. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, does, does the minister agree with me? And I'm, I'm really glad that she's, she's really sort of uh, mentioning about that it is an activity programme. And that crosses over to it being quite a social programme as well. And, and you, you've mentioned that. But do you agree with me that actually, you know, this, this, is, this uh, is going to provide actually safety for children, vulnerable children during this summer? And could she also clarify if she's also worked with the DHA minister on this? Because I know we've obviously got some high crime rates and things like that, that you know, and, and certain um, situations have happened in, in certainly um, my constituency over the last, last couple of weeks. Um, and you talked about targeting um, young people and, and bringing them into these activities. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on that and how, how can we sort of see the, the results of that? And does she agree with me that there, there actually is going to be a benefit in the long term to this government because taking children and, and preventing them getting into crime um, will, will be a huge benefit, cost benefit to, to the Isle of Man in the future? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Lot. President. I, mean, I, I agree with the ethos that the Honourable Member, um, the questioner puts, puts across, absolutely. The um, remit for this scheme has definitely been about food and activities, but this, the, the point you make about it being a social policy, it is. It's about addressing need in a, in a social policy way. Clearly, for those children that might fall between the gaps and not have that contact in communities, this might be a further way and reason to, to reach them. It is on that basis that the activities are included. I haven't spoken to the Home Affairs Minister on this, but I think that the cross-departmental work has gone on between Cabinet Office and Desk, and that has actually been appropriate. There's been a lot of back and forth and discussions with community groups and, and, and providers on this, but I <coughs> would uh, take the, the points that the Honourable Member raises. I do think there'll be a long-term benefit, but it's a pilot, so we need to see how it goes, and then we need to tweak it and <coughs> see if it's worthwhile to change or do again in the future. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mrs Corlett. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the Minister for this proposal. I do support it. Um, and I appreciate, although it is a pilot, is it anticipated that there would be enough resource um, to actually provide this on the scale that would be required into the future? Um, the Minister talks about an analysis, a, 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 a gap analysis. Um, this gap actually could be a mile wide. Um, and does she have some? assurance that there is funding available to provide the services that would be required in the future. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> President. Um, I don't think I've raised the point about a gap, gap analysis. I think that any future scheme would need to look at the funding available to see you know, whether it is matching the um, ability to deliver, which is also, unless government is actually doing this itself, which I don't think would work that well, because I think you need the on-the-ground community input. You know, I think it's always going to be rely on the ability to deliver, which would be down to those individual organisations. Final Thank supplementary, you, Mr. Mrs. Pearl Wilson. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, in reference to the point raised by the honourable member for Douglas South, Mrs. Christian, does the minister agree with me that this is a pilot? <coughs> but I think, depending on how that pilot goes, there's obviously other work that happens across government, including the police early action team and the link programme that reaches out to children who do. Uh, find themselves um, on the edge of criminality um, and looks to, to divert them and find activities and so on. And of course, if the pilot is a success, that there may well be scope to look at how hey, hey. some of these initiatives can, can, be, can be joined up. Thank you, hey, Mr. Hey. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I mean, I, I, I agree um, with Mr. Paul Wilson on this. Um, 
I think that the youth services, ha in particular, have those sorts of partnerships. I think that upon evaluation, you might see how, how these other things can link in with, with future initiatives. It's, it's very tricky, isn't it? Because actually, on the one hand, it's, it's about food, and on the other hand, it's about broader social issues. But you're right in terms of looking at it as a cohesive way and joining up some of these things in, in, in the future. Thank you, Mr. President. On to question 20. Then I call on the Honourable Member for Russian, the Lorda. Good morning, Dr. Ryan. Uh, I'd like to ask the Minister for the Cabinet Office how much longer COVID-19 surveillance reports will be produced, how accurately reported t positive test results reflect the numbers of cases in the community, and whether there is any change in guidance during the current spike in cases. Well, on the Shop, Minister for uh, the Cabinet Office to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The COVID-19 surveillance reports will continue throughout the summer and over the winter months. Subject to final determination, the plan may well expand, to the, to report, expand the report to include additional surveillance to monitor the levels of other respiratory infections, particularly influenza and respiratory syndical virus. Similar reports are published elsewhere in the UK. Um, it is intended that, that a fuller epidemiological surveillance report will give insight into wider issues affecting our population and potential impact on health services. This is part of the Public Health Winter Plan, which will feed into work on the wider governmental winter, winter plan. The accuracy of surveillance is affected by changes in testing regimes, and this may need to be given further consideration. Levels of infection seen from testing are also always likely to be an underestimate of the true level. However, triangulation of information via a range of surveillance methods is used to provide insight into levels of infection within the population. During the most recent spike, there was no change to the core public health advice, but the intensity of messaging to the public was increased. Advice regarding hands, face, space and ventilate and encouraging of testing if displaying symptoms of COVID-19 remained appropriate mitigations and were reflected in the continued public messaging. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Laura. Uh, is the Minister not concerned that we're perhaps in a little bit danger of garbage in, garbage out with these reports? In the post-TT outbreak, the official statistics were that there were 228 uh, cases active, uh, and I think that that is just orders of magnitude out from the experience on the ground and, and the experience of honourable members. Um, would the Minister accept that they were just way away from reality in, in that particular time frame. And with that in mind, will the minister be sort of giving up on these because they're just so inaccurate? Or is some effort going to be made in terms of improving the accuracy of reporting and making sure that people do actually report positive cases uh, when they happen? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I think unless we're going to get back to a point of, you know, legislating and mandating for this in legislative terms, you really you are, are relying on people to decide to test, respond to the public health messaging, and then report that in. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the broader endemic approach has been laid out. There are going to be times when, you know, there are more cases and, and less, you know, it's, it, it's gone down again more recently. So I think for now it's appropriate to stick to the current reporting and perhaps evaluate things in the winter as it's been indicated from um, your public health would be the intention to do with informing the, the winter plan. So I'm, I'm content with that for now. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Lord. I think I said the, the, the end of June, having a report, official statistics saying there's only 228 was uh, so far detached from uh, the experience that was um, being lived. Uh, where we did see a lot of public health advice was around um, the usual how to deal with the virus, which I think most people are, are comfortable with now. But I, what I didn't hear an awful lot of was still that encouraging people to report it. It's a very simple process. It's online. It's, um, I think it's a couple of tick boxes when I went on it, uh, when I was, uh, had the look of having COVID just after TT myself. It's not a complicated process, but we just need to reiterate that on social media yeah. and regular media to encourage so that we actually, this, the, these public health reports that are being distributed actually mean something. I think that's the challenge I put back to the minister. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I will take that point away to build into the other messaging around the other mitigation suggestions. It is a separate point, so I'm very happy to take that away. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Henderson. My electorate, would the Shabeshock agree with me that maybe it's now time to phase out reporting and put all the energies directed into public health information for uh, continuation of the vaccination programme? 
Minister Trucklein. Thank you, Mr. President. I think um, you know that, that um, the interim director of public health and public health itself would take a view on the on the value of actually you know <coughs> monitoring, and um, really that's for them to say and advise on. I think that the the two things, um, you know, the vaccination program and the surveillance, <laughs> sort of they are two separate but in interconnected things. Um, so I think that we would look for a, a steer really as um, from public health as to whether it would be appropriate to not have those reports anymore or indeed has been indicated you know that the idea about maybe expanding them um, which effectively would be done through um, looking for other other illnesses it would really be done through wastewater testing and things like that what we're perhaps going a little bit beyond the original point of the question there but I hope that helps the the honourable member in terms of you know my, my thoughts on this thank you Mr President on to question 21 call on the honourable member for Arby Castamaloo Mr Morehouse Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the Minister for Cabinet Office whether the community infrastructure levy is still being progressed. Call on Mr. Vaisha, Minister for the Cabinet Office, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. The merits of introducing a community infrastructure levy are being looked at as part of a larger project on development viability. The importance of good viability evidence has been stressed to this Honourable Court previously and the Cabinet Office planning policy position stays the same that in order to deliver a community infrastructure levy <coughs> successfully which requires um, specific regulations and to reap the potential economic benefits for new or improved community infrastructure which has been the intention behind including it in the Act, we must be able to have a defendable charging structure based on sound evidence. So that's a little bit more complex than it might first appear. Consultants were appointed in November 2021 to conduct viability testing of the island development plan to determine acceptable levels of charges and contributions to be levied through a potential new community infrastructure levy or CIL. The specification also included looking at the existing planning contributions system, which is known more commonly as Section 13 planning agreements. The, point, um, the main point to, to answer, as far as I can today, I have to say, the Honourable Member's question, is that the report from the specialists appointed to carry out the work is due to be received by Cab Cabinet Office at the end of August. It will need to then be considered, and I would therefore propose to make a further statement on the full findings of the report in October, Tim Wald, 2022. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. for that clar clarity. In terms of going forward, it's good that you're actually looking at all the issues here. Um, in terms of it remaining a possibility, given the issues in the wider housing market and all the other concerns that have been raised in the last few months, it really does need to be looked at with new eyes and it's good that that information will be available. Hopefully that information will be available soon after you receive it and then we can go forward. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Move on to question 22. Call on the Honourable Member for Arby Castamaloo, Mr. Warhouse. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the Minister for the Treasury whether the value of the assets which a person can retain when receiving financial support from the government will be reassessed ahead of the 2023 budget. Colonel Minister for Treasury, to, rep to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Each autumn, as part of the annual benefits uprating exercise, Treasury considers whether the amount of capital which may be disregarded for income-related social security benefit purposes should be changed from the following April. This will form part of the budget considerations for 2023. Any increase in this amount would come at a cost, and this would need to be considered alongside other competing issues. Thank you. Mr. Moorhouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister. I think one concern refers to the actual technicality in terms of um, if you were to look at the 2016 Social Security Income Support Documentation, um, you actually see that support is available, you've got the protection there, but if money is still owed, then that's got to be paid for in terms of the care provision. If that is the case, is there going to be ultimately no limit in terms of what will be protected? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I mean, the, the, the regulations and the governance around this are quite clear. Obviously, if the Honourable Member has a particular constituent who's come into a problem with this, be more than happy to take that forward. But as with previous um, questions from the Honourable Member, the benefit system, whilst it tries to be fair and simple, can be quite complicated with relation to individual um, circumstances and if people are in doubt in terms of their eligibility for support 
or the issues with their existing assets, we would ask them to contact the benefits section to look into these in a bit more detail. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. Whilst this current provision is fit for purpose, in terms of an area of concern, many people see it as being something that could be altered quite dramatically between now and the next election. Is that something the Ministry is minded to consider in terms of the current block of money that is now protected is relatively low and some people would like that to be reconsidered. Is that something that is on the department's radar? Thank you very much. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I mean, obviously, the, the reach of <coughs> um, assets can have quite significant in terms of whether people need short-term benefits or long-term benefits. And I think the, the Honourable Member is probably mentioning in terms of long-term provision of social care and the drawdown on, on people's assets that that may have. And obviously it is um, one of the in initiatives but, um, for the Health and Care Transformation Programme to look at the long-term funding of social care, see how that relates to the benefit pro process and then come forward with proposals to actually try to allay some of the fears that he's representing. Thank you. Move on to question 23. I'll call on the Honourable Member for Council, Mr Henderson. Guru my Elector, I <coughs> beg leave to ask the Special Officer Inzi further to answers given by our predecessor and Tinwald on the 15th of June 2021. Uh, what action has been taken to prevent unnecessary running of vehicle engines in schools and in other places <coughs> where young people gather? Call on Shop, Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. The issue raised by the Honourable Member has been ongoing for a number of years and is not just isolated to schools and the Department of Education, Sport and Culture. As previously stated by my predecessor in June 21, there is no department policy specifically relating to leaving car engines running or idling, and there is no plan for this. It is already an offence to leave the engine of a vehicle running without cause. However, I will ensure that further communication is issued to the schools on this matter. I've also um, been in discussions with the Minister for the Department of Infrastructure, and we're going to look at the possibility of installation of suitable signage um, at schools to encourage drive drivers to not leave their engines idling. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Henderson. Through my elector, and, uh, I thank the Shabesha Kinsey for her answer. It's positive. However, could she uh, give us a little more detail uh, with regards to the fact that I'm specifically, for the purpose of this question, focusing on schools, not for <coughs> I'm concentrating on our young lungs that are in our classrooms and around the school premises areas. And does the minister realize that uh, even today, parents and others, delivery drivers and so on, will leave vehicles running near classrooms with exhaust fumes pumping up the side of the buildings, filling up playgrounds and so on, and that we really do need to have some sort of, it doesn't have to be, um, some sort of monster gap analysis. This is just a straightforward uh, cascading down to all schools to advise head teachers who are teaching our children about climate change and pollution to inform and advise parents, not a big stick, to switch engines off when it's not needed. And she also agree that we do need some signage outside and that I have sent her some signage already issued by the likes of the RAC and other well-known organisations. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, obviously, um, schools within their PSC, uh, PSHE and citizenship schemes do discuss all of the sort of issues around climate change. But with regards to the desk staff being responsible for enforcement of this, um, clearly we all know the challenges we've got currently um, with our, our, our staffing, um, but I do think that installation of signage will go a long way to supporting what the Honourable um, Member is looking for. And, you know, I may even look with the, with the Minister for DOI that perhaps we do involve the children in looking at how we can make that signage an item that they recognise and they will then take that message home to their parents. You know, we, maybe I will have a competition in the autumn uh, and see what we can do to make sure that signage is appropriate and 
but people will hopefully adhere to it. Supplementary, Mr Henderson. And I thank the Special Kinsey again for the positive answer. Um, could she just uh, recognise for me that, in fact, I'm not wanting an enforcement and I'm not wanting a big stick. What I'm wanting is enlightenment so that information trickles out into uh, people's thinking to ch actually change habits that have become so, we've become so used to it gets parents and others, delivery drivers, thinking about what they're doing and to voluntarily turn their engines off. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. And, and obviously, I thank the Honourable Member for that. Um, none of us really want to be around our schools with big sticks, but I do think the message, <laughs> message, me, message is, is key. And the more we can make that pronounced around our school settings and ensure and encourage and obviously our head teachers will um, enforce that within their schools. We will request that as soon as schools are back in September. Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Thank you, um, Mr President. And does the Minister agree with me that this is a really welcome intervention and that um, enlightenment, as the questioner called it, is very, very important? Does the Minister also agree, though, that there are some vehicles that actually need to keep their um, engines running for things like, for, for things like um, not draining batteries when, uh, when vehicle lifts are going? And so, therefore, it would be quite important as part of the enlightenment to have places away from the school and away from children to enable vehicles that do need to have their uh, engines running so the batteries aren't drained are also included in that enlightenment. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Yes, the Honourable um, Minister for DOI is correct. Um, it does depend on the vehicles that people are driving, but the key message will be that we need to make sure this is a more joined up approach and hopefully work with the Department of Infrastructure to put this signage in place and hopefully then encourage people to adhere to the policy. Yeah. On to question 24. I call on the Honourable Member for Russian, Dr Hayward. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I should like to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture whether she considers that there are sufficient laptops and iPads in her department's primary schools and what her department's policy is on the provision and renewal of laptops and iPads in its primary schools. Well, on the Chauvet Sharp Minister for Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The current resourcing situation in primary schools has been arrived at using a pupil to device ratio for iPads and the school's largest class size as an indicator of how many laptops to deploy to each school. This is adjusted for large schools with two or three form entry and schools on split sites. This arrangement has been in place for several years and was agreed by school leaders in collaboration with officers within the department's central team. As a result of the digital work undertaken this year, which looked at hardware, platform and curriculum, the department plans to now review the type and quantity of pupil devices in school to ascertain whether their provision needs to be increased or changed. In the meantime, if a school requires access to alternative devices, a request should be made to the department for consideration. Some schools have raised funds individually to purchase additional devices and some have chosen desktop computers in addition to the laptops and iPads supplied for pupil use. Thank you. Supplementary, Dr Hayward. Uh, thank you. Uh, data previously provided by the Honourable Member in answer to a written question indicates that there are 15 out of 32 primary schools, that's nearly half our schools, where the total number of laptops available to support learning is lower than the largest class size within the school. I shan't name the schools, it actually doesn't matter whether you're one short or whether you're 15 short, like some schools are. The consequence is that teachers have to plan their lessons so that resources are shared, and that hampers the development of individual <coughs> schools. What's worse is that there are four schools that do not have a class set of iPads, and they are also schools that don't have a full set of laptops either. So that gives the teachers of those large classes no opportunity to develop children's IT skills. Does the Minister recognise that provision of up-to-date, functioning IT equipment is important to support learning within our schools and that lack of such equipment is going to reduce learning opportunities? Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, I'm sure the Honourable Member is aware that all of our IT equipment in schools is managed and comes from the Department of um, Government Technology Services. 
Um, a review takes place at the beginning of each academic year with the aim of redistributing devices to ensure equitable provision across all primary schools. And this is based on, as I said in my answer, the number of pupils and the largest class sizes. As with all areas of the curriculum, schools have the freedom to diversify and enhance... Apologies. <laughs> enhance any area of the curriculum they choose. Some schools have taken the choice to use some of their budget to increase the number of devices, for example, running specific projects for year six students where more devices are needed. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Dr. Hayward. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In the earlier answer, the Minister indicated that um, devices had been bought by some schools from their own funds, and actually some schools have used parent-raised funds to buy those devices. How is that compatible with her department's uh, stated aim of redistributing those devices between schools? And does that mean that parents are working towards something for their children that is then taken away from them? Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said, with regards to our schools, we, they have the freedom to enhance the curriculum, and whether that is with digital devices or in any way, we give that freedom to and policy to our schools. Um, obviously, obviously um, with us moving into more of a digital age, this is something that we need to work with government technology services to make sure that we have the most up-to-date, appropriate equipment in our schools for the curriculum and for the future education provision for all. Supplementary, Laura. Good morning, Dr. Can I ask the Minister what her policy is on access? Um, we, if devices are needing to be shared in some classes and some uh, places just um, can't get access to them one per pupil, then what is the Minister's policy about individual pupils being able to access IT devices? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Again, um, obviously access, our teachers are best placed to know the requirements within their school and I know that school classes do share and they'll make sure whatever their activity is that they've got adequate um, equipment if it is for, for IT. Do, do I think that um, there is currently enough funding? As we're all aware in this honourable court, there's a funding review taking place within for the Department of Education by the Cabinet Office and I'm hopeful when that review is concluded that we do have a full baseline budget provision for appropriate education and resources. Supplementary, Dr. Hill. Thank you. I'll have two more stabs at this, if I might. One is, what's the policy on IT provision for primary school children and the ratio of those? And this is a bit akin to saying how many slates and pencils do they have or how many exercise books they have. And the second is, what's the policy on redistributing devices and does it exclude those that have been bought by the school from their funds from being included in that redistribution. Otherwise, it sounds a bit like communism with computers. <laughs> Minister to reply. Apologies, Mr. President. I didn't hear the first part of that question. I only caught the second. The policy on provision of IT equipment for primary school children. As, as I've stated in, in my previous answer, um, the, the aim is to distribute the devices to ensure equitable provision across our primary schools. If a school has had the funding for from a charity or from parents, I would not expect the school to lose that resource. Move on to question 25 and a call on the Honourable Member for Middle, Mr Peters. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I'd like to ask the hard-working member for Enterprise <laughs> how many jobs are to be lost at West Atlantic Aviation Maintenance and when and why, how many jobs will remain and if you'll make a statement. Call on the Member for Enterprise, Mr Johnson, to reply. And of course, it's always disappointing to hear of uh, potential redundancy in any local business. And it will be, of course, a very worrying time for those employees and their families. The department has engaged the company throughout the current situation and has offered to provide assistance to both the business and affected employees. Ultimately, this is a business decision arising from a change in strategic direction. And whilst the department has made it clear it can, it can consider a number of options in terms of support, as the department understands, the reduction in operation remains planned to proceed. Whilst it would not be appropriate for me to discuss specific details of the local workers impacted or the business itself, the broader engineering sector on the island remains strong and has a number of live employment opportunities, and members will be aware of the current levels of vacancies within, a, within other sectors of the economy. The department and colleagues with, within Treasury 
will continue to support individuals who wish to secure alternative employment that may be ultimately affected here or with any other, any other business. Supplementary, Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. President, and, uh, and thank you to the Member for Enterprise for answering that. I'm led to believe that there are something like 11 of 13 jobs are going to disappear at that site. I also believe that West Atlantic renewed the lease on their hangar shortly prior to announcing their effective relocation elsewhere, thus preventing it being used by anyone else. Does the Department agree that this potentially anti-competitive practice should be fully in investigated and the hangar made available to other suitable tenants? Thank you, sir. Member to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you for the, for the question. Um, yes, the, hang the hangar is on the lease. That's, that I'm aware of that. Um, what, all I can say on, on this, with my, my limited information I have, is, is that the, there are ongoing discussions uh, in, in the situation over the lease. Um, and really, I can't, I can't add any more at this stage. Um, the decision is, is very much based on the fact that um, the aircraft that they're servicing have now are obsolete, are becoming obsolete, and therefore the, the, the practice is moving, moving off island. Um, so we are, we are where we are. There is, there is an agreement in place, so there will be negotiations go, going forward to try and resolve the situation. I can't really add any more at this stage. Supplementary, Mr. Mohers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just to extend that, in terms of the availability of the hangar, competition, other providers have considered making use of it, but there appears to be an issue in terms of the cost structure. Could that also be looked at? Because it's really a priority that we do try and keep this sector going. And not long ago, Manx Airlines had lots of apprenticeships in this area, and we would like to see that come back. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply? Or member? Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, um, hard to respond to that other than to say that, uh, as I say, that as, as an industry, there are great opportunities elsewhere within the engineering and manufacturing uh, on the island. So uh, you know, I'm very confident that uh, those individuals have been affected will, will find uh, alternatives. And, and in, that, in the process of the negotiation of the lease, there are, I, I'm aware there's, there are works to be done on, on the hangar. And I hope we get to a situation when you know, it, it has become available again for, for another business to, to move forward. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. Um, is the DfE aware that after five decades, all aircraft heavy maintenance will cease in the Isle of Man? And could the honourable member please, um, would, he be, would he consider to come back to report to this honourable court what plans on how this, um, this uh, essential part of infrastructure can be regained in the future. Thank you. Member to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Question. I, mean, I think ultimately this is a, this is a, a business decision, um, and I think the important thing is, going forward, as a, as a government, as a department, that we, we make sure we, we're laying the foundations so that the businesses can come to the island and, and, if, and be attracted to the island and, and thrive. And that there's a whole range of issues there that to make that happen, whether it's talking, talking about employment legislation, all the issues we're talking about. So, as I say, the, the, we've got a very positive, very healthy engineering manufacturing sector on the island. It has come under challenge. You, you mentioned aviation. That, that, is, that is a big issue. I think with COVID, we've seen real challenges. And one of the things the department is trying to do in working with businesses is to look at how they can diversify and move into different areas to make sure that they are viable. And that's, a, that's an ongoing process and we'll, and we'll continue. And we'll continue. Supplementary, Dr. Allenson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for, for his answers. Would he agree with me that leasing of um, public owned assets has to provide um, good value to the taxpayer and a decent return? But at the same time, his department is actively looking at how to support a sector that has undergone quite seismic changes over the last two years and will continue to do so both in terms of employment on the island but also training and apprenticeships, as he's already commented on. Thank you. Member to reply. Thank you, Mr. President, and may I thank the honourable member for his, his comments. So I fully agree with what he's saying. That, that is that is an important role now for for the agency, uh, for the business agency, and for the, for the enterprise in general, is to make sure that we are helping businesses to be match fit. To and that that's a case of not just looking at new opportunities and new businesses, which is very important, but also making sure existing businesses are, are, are taking a hard look at themselves and making sure that they're, they're, they're doing the right things. And if, wherever the government, whether the department can help with that, that is something we'll, we'll continue to, to engage with. 